what do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. Because if where we are, there's nothing else. And do you have views about what should be done about that? Can't you guess? Uh, well, it could be on a on a spectrum from mass sterilisation to no, no. Uh, to to uh, you know greater availability of contraception. I don't know. I don't know what your views are as to what can be done about it. Well, I think I think uh, it might be described as a voluntary family limitation. I grew up in the 1960s watching those TV commercials with those starving kids in Africa who stared vacantly at the camera with sad eyes and distended bellies. And in sixth grade, my Glee Club teacher, Mr. Collins, had us change the words in this song we were singing. Three billion people in the world to four billion people in the world. And I was shocked. I couldn't believe that the population was so big. And I was even more shocked because no one else in the class seemed at all disturbed by this fact. And a couple days later, I told my friend Susie Hollander that because there seemed to be too many people in the world for it to handle, that I wasn't going to have any kids. And she looked at me and she replied that she was going to have three. This is unsustainable. I am not a bigot. Mother Earth is dying because I exist. I trust these philanthropist eugenicists who just want what's best for me. I am an empowered and free global citizen. Is a war over resources? Or will it stop growing because people choose to have smaller families? And by smaller families, I mean one child families. And this is where people start getting nervous talking about overpopulation and population issues because they're scared that I'm going to take away their rights to have children. But I don't want to take people's rights away. I want to give people rights. Hi, we're Natasha and Luca, that vegan couple from YouTube and other social media. The time has come to make animal rights history. Join us in London on October 7 for the Animal Rebellion. It's a two-week disruption, but you can come for any time you're able to. Taking direct action for animals to disrupt business as usual and demand serious change from governments is what the animal victims and the planet desperately need. Hey everyone, we're in Lisbon, Portugal. We are disrupting in a supermarket, or a shopping centre I should say, with lots of restaurants around us. We have about 23 activists with us tonight and we're playing the screams of animals. If we all sterilize ourselves and give the animals human rights, we can all have equal animal rights together and eat plant-based fortified kibble to stop the hashtag climate crisis and achieve hashtag climate justice with the good grown-ups at the big banks, governments, and global corporations. You know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade up in medical costs. But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. So you, of course, so we're that's making- That's an interesting thing you just said. Our Earth is warming up and our oceans are rising. Extreme weather is wrecking millions of lives. From California to the Amazon, our forests are burning. We are in a climate emergency. We cannot let this happen on our watch. Up to one million species are becoming extinct because of mankind's actions, and time is running out. History shows us that when enough people rise up and demand change, those in power have no choice but to act. Millions of people around the world are taking to the streets on a climate strike, demanding our leaders listen to the science and act. We must take back power. That means voting for leaders who care about the future of our planet. Join in supporting environmental movements like Greenpeace or Fridays for Future, a global youth movement inspired by Greta Thunberg and doing what we can to live in a greener lifestyle, like cutting out meat and dairy in your diet and reducing plastic use. I mean, the population's gonna have to stop growing at some point, so why not stop now? Instead of wishing that some invention or technology will save us that doesn't even exist yet, and we're not even sure works. So for everyone to have quality of life, the number of humans on Earth needs to go down. And I believe that it needs to go down to two billion people, which sounds radical because there are seven billion people on the planet today, but it's actually the world population of just 80 years ago. 
So let's change our idea of what the ideal family looks like. And let's not be afraid to talk about overpopulation because it is not about taking rights away from people. It is about giving opportunities to women, children, and future generations. And lastly, let's be part of the solution. The Red Brigade symbolizes the blood that connects all of us. It's the blood that connects humans, species, all of us to the earth. So for me, the Red Brigade is a vessel to hold the emotions of um, grief and loss and rage and joy and love and peace. And it's those emotions that connect all of us. And um, we work or we try to work as one, which symbolizes that we are all connected. We act as one, we try to, we move as one. We are all one. Everything is relative and morality is subjective, so we must act together to save the planet. You are highly evolved gods who evolved by random chance through evolution that created something out of nothing in a meaningless cold material universe that evolved life out of nothing by transforming cosmic ponscom into monkeys who must save the planet by getting rid of themselves and creating a totalitarian technocratic global monoculture society. We must eat nutrient-fortified kibble in our smart cities and pay for our cockroach milk and VR porn with carbon credits so the IMF, World Bank and Fortune 100 can save the planet from the evil CO2 we exhale and poor little Billie Eilish can have her future back. I am not deceived. Pop culture is healthy and is not programming me to self-destruct. I will save the world by eating sustainable vegan kibble and demanding the government give me the same rights as animals. I am not being dehumanized. I am empowered. Veganism and vasectomies should be mandatory. Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide and I trust the people on the TV screen. Peace, Reflections What's going on, bigots? How's it going out there? We got a bunch of people watching. We got some chickens and roosters having a little party outside. Please excuse the crowing and the <laughs> sound that you're gonna hear for a little bit. They should go away soon. We got a bunch of people jumping in. What's happening? We talked, what was it, two days ago? About the greatest vegan gesticulator of all time, Dr. Gregor. We talked about Dr. Gregor, everybody's favorite vegan gesticulator. Today, we've got one of the other great, <laughs> one of the other great vegan doctors that these people worship, right? One of the great vegan doctors out there promoting the plant-based diet, telling us that we should remove animal foods, that we should remove animal fat and protein from our diet and replace it with plant-based kibble. Replace it with plant-based kibble. Today, we are talking about some more of these degenerates. We got a couple, couple degenerates up on the screen today. We've got this male stripper called Kai Green, who was a bodybuilder. Not a bodybuilding, not a big fan of the bodybuilding scene. We could talk about this a little bit later. That's going to be the second portion of the show. But the first portion, we're going to be talking all about our buddy, Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Neil Barnard is... Doing a really good job. He's really helping us out to discredit this plant-based kibble movement. In fact, Dr. Neil Barnard is working just as hard as Dr. Greger to make these vegans look ridiculous, to make their message sound completely incoherent. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We've got a clip from Brian Rose's channel, uh, London Real. It, Brian Rose, good job on London Real lately, man. I, uh, and I've tuned in and out to some of the content not really big on the whole like self-help um, space, right? That's kind of the, the, the what do you call it, the genre that Brian, uh, Brian Rose and London Real inhabit, kind of like this Tony Robbins type, like secular success religion. Um, so not a big fan of the genre in general, but it's been cool to see Brian Rose over the last year 
every once in a while as I pop in and tune in to, uh, to what he's been doing since he tried his vegan marathon. Right? For the last year, he's been kind of playing around with a plant-based diet, and it seems like, just like with all these vegans, with all these future ex-vegans, remember, like 85% of vegetarians, and that's not, that's vegetarians. They still eat some animal foods. 85% of vegetarians and vegans will go back to eating meat within like three years. Now, we've talked about this. Uh, there was a Psychology Today article we've talked about many times. <sighs> but Brian Rose learned a little bit about veganism, tried it out, and it didn't work. Just like with all of these vegans, because it is a nutrient-deficient starvation diet. Right? It's not suitable for human beings at any stage of development, especially not children. Right, now, we've seen a lot of people talking about the Game Changers film, which I think we might have to do a special stream about that. What do you guys think? Should we do a whole stream just dedicated to the Game Changers? I have so many clips. I mean, there's a clip of Dr. Neil Barnard we're talking about today. There's a clip of, of Barnard talking about the Game Changers. We've got Dr. Greger talking about the Game Changers, both with Brian Rose of the London Real channel. So that'll be cool. I think we'll have to do it. We'll have to do a special one just about Game Changers. But a lot of people are getting duped into this by these Netflix movies, by these high production value, shitty documentaries, by this degenerate brainwashing that we get pushed on us through mass media, through the internet, and through all these different channels that we've got constantly pushing um, images, words, slogans at us to influence our behavior, to control our behavior. And to make us think that it's our own idea when we put ourselves on a full-on starvation diet like the vegan diet. So, <sighs> Brian Rose interviewing Dr. Neil Barnard. Here's a little bit about Brian's um, history in this video. Do you eat animals or plants? The vegan debate. I watched uh, part of the first half of it. And then I found this section, which is a great introduction with what we're talking about today, um, to what we're talking about today, which is Dr. Neil Barnard completely discrediting himself and self-destructing, saying completely inane and ridiculous things like so many of these vegan advocates and doctors do. In questions, and this is Neil talking about, in his opinion, the benefits of a plant-based diet. First of all, you can't survive on it. Um, if you try to eat nothing but meat, you, you remember the, the English sailors who all got scurvy? Yeah, um, okay. I mean, th that, that's sort of the Atkins diet taken to an extreme, and somebody realized, wait, 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 meat doesn't actually have vitamin C, guys, and that's where the limes came in. Um, okay, but, lime. but, but, I mean, there's a lot more to it. There isn't any fiber in that diet whatsoever. There is protein, but the whole idea that, that meat jealously guards protein is not true. I mean, there's protein. <laughs> okay, so here he's talking about the carnivore diet, right? all meat diet. I think Brian might have brought it up. And he says, you can't survive on it. You're going to get the scurvy. You're going to get that scurvy. Of course, we talked about scurvy. We talked about the scurvy issue. I mean, this was disproven back in 1930 when Stephenson and Anderson, Stephenson, Wilhelm Moore Stephenson, who wrote the book, The Fat of the Land. It's also published under the title, um, Not by Bread Alone. This book right here. It's a pretty good book. If you're interested in the history of all meat diets, it's a little bit washed out there. I mean, I'm not going to adjust the camera, but um, not by bread alone, slash the fat of the land. Really good introduction to the idea of an all-meat diet. 1930, this study, these two dudes under strict observation at the Bellevue Hospital in New York, no symptoms of scurvy, no symptoms of illness. In fact, both of them performed incredibly well. Their gingivitis went away. I thought that was an interesting uh, detail, but we talked about this in the last stream. The scurvy thing is so easily debunked. There are thousands of people doing an animal-based diet, doing a full-on carnivorous diet where they're not eating any fruits, where they're not trying to get vitamin C from any plant sources at all. And they're not even eating liver, which actually does have more vitamin C than muscle meat. A lot of these people are just doing muscle meat. I'm not saying that you should just do muscle meat. You should do what works for you. You should do what allows you to perform your best, what allows you to live, what allows you to not be shitting 12 times a day like Dr. Greger's daily dozen. But we've, we know that nobody's dying of scurvy on a carnivore diet. Yet these guys keep throwing it out there. All right, so just them, I mean, just, no, let, let, let's move on. Let's move on. I don't want to get stuck here. I could babble forever about these things. Let's, let's move on. If you, you ate 2,000 calories a day, 
roughly, I'm going to say, unless you're training, in which case you're eating 3,000. Yeah. Um, if you ate 2,000 calories of nothing but broccoli, not here. that you would ever do this, but if that's what you did, you would get about all the protein that you need, that the government says you need, plus about 90 extra grams. And if the next day you ate nothing but lentils, you would get all the protein you need plus an extra 100 grams. Plants have enormous amounts of protein in it. But to, to make it short and sweet for anybody who's just tuning in for just this one bit, a healthy diet is four things. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, or the legume group, beans, peas, lentils. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and you... Wow, all right. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So if you just eat broccoli, you're going to get all the protein you need, says Dr. Neil Barnard. Uh, this is this is very, very dangerous advice, right? If you have growing children, if you have a you know three-year-old kid, you've got a two-year-old toddler waddling around, babbling a bunch of nonsense and gibberish, much like Dr. Gregor. If you've got a toddler and you feed it nothing but broccoli, nothing but plant foods, without supplementation, heavy supplementation of the vitamins and minerals that they're not going to be getting from these foods they will die. Dude, this guy just said, this dude just said, a pure broccoli diet will give you all the protein you need. That is absolutely ridiculous. Eating that much broccoli, you will be shitting your face off all day. You're going to be doing the Dr. Gregor daily dozen bowel movements, right? But also, you're not going to be getting any bioavailable protein. The protein that is in these plant foods, the protein that is in these plants is not absorbable, not digestible. You need to eat significantly more of these plant-based protein sources to get the same amount of amino acids because they're not bioavailable in these plants. The only source of bioavailable, easily digestible protein and fat is animal foods. There are essential fatty acids. There are essential amino acids. Those come from the essential foods, which are animal foods. So Dr. Neil Barnard, I mean, we could just end this right here. This dude is, uh, is saying that an all-broccoli diet would give you all the protein you need. These people are out there educating people on how to feed their kids. These people are out there trying to get governments to set policies to force these diets on everybody in the name of saving the planet, in the name of saving our health, in the name of saving the world, saving the economy. These people are pushing this on everybody. Very, very dangerous. You should supplement with vitamin B12. Boom, and that is Dr. Barnard talking about how not eating meat can contribute to a lot of factors that we haven't really talked about before. Diabetes, that's something we've always been told is due to sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Okay, <laughs> diabetes caused by meat. Diabetes is caused by meat, says Dr. Neil Barnard. Absolutely ridiculous claim. Completely ridiculous claim. And Dr. Neil Barnard, let's, let's look at Dr. Neil Barnard. He's the founder of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Wow, that sounds so official. That sounds so responsible. That sounds so authoritative. He lives in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's great. That's great. Washington, D.C. There are all sorts of great people that live in Washington, D.C. that are advocating for so many good things, right? Like everybody's favorite champion of science, Jeffrey Epstein, had a lot of really close associates in Washington, D.C. Um, so Neil Barner from Washington, D.C. advocating preventative medicine and higher ethical standards in research and medical training. Uh, Dr. Neil Barnard looking in this picture like he is taking his own advice and eating that all broccoli diet. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. What is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine? Check out the Vegan Starter Kit by Neil Barnard. <laughs> we, need, we are going to make a video of the Vegan Starter Kit. Um, that, that's actually a funny vegan, vegan title, vegan video title. But ah, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine advocates for, advocates for a plant-based diet. We've got all sorts of celebrities that promote them and they've got all sorts of big money from animal rights activist groups like PETA funding them if you check out their 2018 annual report remember this is the group that actually went to Washington went in front of the White House with this go vegan sign that you see right here pulled up on the screen if you're listening to this later we're looking at the 2018 annual report from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine these people are advocating for guess what Government veganism, government mandated veganism. I mean, we've got to get rid of all these, all of this nasty CO2. What better way to do it than getting everybody on 
a plant-based kibble diet, <laughs> malnourishing them so that they can't breed. Look at this. All right, we got eliminating animal use in pediatrics training. Eliminating animal use in pediatrics training. How interesting. Uh, what else? Break it up with bacon, dropping hot dogs from children's menus, partnering with U.S. mayors to beat heart disease, right? So partnering with the mayors, this is a strategy that's been implemented really effectively uh, by the U.N., by this Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 um, uh, campaign. Right. So since 1992, when Agenda 21 at the Rio summit uh, became a public policy for many of these peoples um, uh, who are pushing for plant based diets, who are pushing for um, a so-called sustainable food production system, a lot of these people are tying this in with the sustainable development goals. Right? They're saying that this is going to help save the planet. It's going to help save the world from the global warming. And what do we have to do? To save the planet, well, of course, the elites say we've got to decrease the human population. We've got to stop the carbon pollution, right? Carbon being that stuff that you exhale, that stuff that comes out of your mouth when you breathe, when you speak. Right? These people have been pushing this stuff for a while now. And you see these, like the World Council of Mayors. I think that's what they call it, the World Council of Mayors, where these different mayors from different cities, like New York, San Francisco... A lot of these you know, big uh, degenerate cities, uh, the Council of Mayors essentially helps to implement the Agenda 21 goals, right? sidestepping the need for legislation to be passed in the U.S. These mayors agree to implement the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which basically means everything's more expensive, food is more expensive, all resources, all resources are more expensive, and eventually we get to all be crowded into a smart city an apartment, total control technocracy grid. And so these people at the uh, PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, are fighting to remove animal foods from schools. They're calling U.S. food policy racist. Remember that clip that we put from that doctor? He says, oh, drinking milk is racist, and the food policy is racist, because if you give kids milk, that's racist, man. Milk is racist. Combating animal use in military medical training. Conquering Alzheimer's disease with human-based research. <laughs> okay. Reversing diabetes with Dr. Barnard. These are some of the 2018 programs that were implemented from this group that Dr. Neil Barnard was a major part of. I don't know if he started it, but he's way into it. So that's Dr. Neil Barnard. Let's hear what he has to say about veganism, about your diet, and about whether meat has a place in the human diet. So last year, uh, a guest came on my show. His name is John Joseph. He's the former lead singer of a hardcore punk band called the Cro-Mags. It was big in the 80s and 90s. And he had uh, become a Hare Krishna monk. Back How's the audio? The audio levels evil? Vegan diet e equal? Not evil. Five years ago, way before. <laughs> audio levels equal about. out there? Um, he also went on to have a, you know, a crazy career as a lead singer and a crazy crack addiction and all sorts of other stuff. Yeah. But he used to smoke crack and drink wheat juice, wheatgrass juice, he told me. So, uh, go figure. Yeah, go figure. And so he came on my show. Um, he's been sober for many years now, and he's been running these Ironman triathlons, like about 10 full Ironmans, serious stuff. And uh, he challenged me to, to come to New York City and train with him. And when I was there, he said, Brian, I got this half Ironman coming up. I want you to do it Turn up the audio on the video. And I want you to do it on a plant-based diet. Now, for me, mm. I had never gone really plant-based. I had played around with Meatless Mondays. I had a lot of people on the show before, like Dr. Greger and all sorts of other people talking about the diet. But when John did this to me, I was like, okay, I'm in. So I went 100% plant-based last year. You know, in about three days, I did it. And John kind of gave me some guidance, took me to some great places in New York City. At the same time, I'm training a lot. You know, I've never done an endurance race. I've never had done distance swim or bike or run. And John said, Brian, you're actually gonna feel better. You're gonna have less injuries if you go plant-based. And I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. But okay, I trust you. So I came back to London and told my wife, and she's like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. She's from Bulgaria, where again, there's not a lot of, she didn't grow up with a lot of right. vegans. And, but we figured it out. And all of a sudden, we start, she starts finding different substitutes, sometimes meat substitutes in the form of soy, and then later, maybe not. Maybe just all these other wonderful foods. And we kind of fell in love with vegetables again, and I was like, wow, you know these things taste really good and there's all these different options. And 
once I realized I had to eat more, because at first I just wasn't eating enough, mm -hmm. because you have to, I had to eat more. Also, I was training mm -hmm. a lot, but I just needed to eat more. I got into a really good rhythm. Um, and it part, despite, at one point, my B12 being low and I had some B12 injections, otherwise everything was fine. And then also people said my B12 couldn't have dropped in a few months anyway, so it was probably all right. Okay, no, your B12 definitely can drop in a few months, man. It definitely does. All right, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to manifest like clinical symptoms of the deficiencies. But dude, <laughs> I mean, he, in a very nice way, Brian is talking about how it didn't work for him, how he didn't feel as well as he does when he's eating animal foods. <laughs> Ready B12 deficient. So I did it. I actually ran the race. I finished the race. Um, I did really well. Yeah. And so it was a great experience. And everyone thought I was going to have a steak and a beer at the end of the race. And I didn't feel that way. I actually was like, I feel good. So I told myself I was going to keep it up. And I kept it up. And I kept up for about four or five months, and then I started thinking, am I doing this because I'm dogmatic, or am I doing this because this is the long-term lifestyle and health for me? And I have a history of doing things to death in my mm -hmm. past. I can be very dogmatic, and sometimes it takes me in good places, and sometimes it makes me try to drink myself to death. So I have both things, you know? And sometimes it can make me do a great show like yeah. this. Um, so at the very end of the year, I said to myself, am I doing this for dogmatic reasons, or is this really the right thing? And I, I said, you know what, I am I'm not gonna hold myself to this restricted diet. And I had some, I, I said, I'm gonna try some things. So I, and I also went down the ethical thing too, because I think the more vegetables you eat, the more you think about the health of animals. Right. You know, and so I also started thinking about farm factory animals, and I'm like, I don't wanna be a part of this. And I had flashbacks to the feedlot, I don't wanna be a part of that. Right. Something me, as me as a four-year-old kid knew this was wrong. Okay, so I get So again, always the feedlot, Right, the industrial agriculture system being used to justify going fully vegan. This is a total straw man that gets erected by big ag. Right, the same corporations, the same global corporations, the same big money interests that started the green revolution and the GMO gene revolution. Right? Those are the corporations, those are the people who implemented the system of industrial agriculture. Those are the ones who brought in the feedlot system. Right? Monsanto, Dow, Cargill. These big grain conglomerates, Archer Daniels Midland, all these big corporations, these transnationals, erected the factory farming system. And now they're using it as a straw man to make us feel guilty about eating food and being human. <laughs> they make us guilty for just feeding our children a human appropriate diet. And so we get gaslit into feeling guilty, feeling ashamed, feeling bad, feeling conflicted about eating meat, which we need to do. We need to eat meat. We require animal foods. If you try to replace them with fortified plant kibble, you will suffer the consequences as this guy suffered. Right? He's, let, let's see. It doesn't seem like he suffered as much as many vegans. He did it for like four months. But nobody who goes on a vegan diet doesn't miss f animal foods. Nobody, nobody on a vegan diet doesn't crave meat. <laughs> the end of the year, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna have a bit of sushi. And I had some sushi, and like my body was like, okay, I think this is okay. And my stomach was like, this is okay. And so now I have certain types of animal proteins. And for me, I feel better, and I feel stronger, and I still have a lot of vegetables. I still train a lot. I still don't have a lot any factory farm meats, but for me, I don't know. I don't necessarily have the scientific proof one way or another, but this feels like the right diet for me. Um, what do you think of that? Um, well, first of all, what you did is, is amazing. Um, and it sounds like you trained up quickly. Amazing. Um, you reaffirmed what so many other people have found, which is that it's totally counterintuitive. Um, people imagine if I'm going to bulk up, I've got to be eating, eating meat. And then, of course, they realize that all the biggest animals are herbivores um, and so forth. So, but what you accomplished is it. Wow. <laughs> okay. So right off the bat, you know, with a guy who's skeptical too. I mean, this just shows you how tone deaf and how disconnected some of these people are. Right? This dude, Neil Barnard, talking to a skeptic who did a vegan diet. And he's, he's going to try to twist this and tell him, oh yeah, look, you don't need it. Look how great, look how great it was. You did it. It's so good. He's going to try to brush under the rug all this guy's doubts, everything he knows <laughs> about animal foods and the necessity of animal foods. From first-hand experience, he's gonna to try, to, try to get him to brush it under the rug and tell him, oh look, gorillas, 
Don't eat meat, man. Gorillas don't eat the meat. You don't need meat. Elephants don't eat meat. Look, the biggest animals are vegan. And this is one of the stupidest arguments. First of all, gorillas, gorillas are not fully vegan. They eat other animals. They eat other monkeys. Chimpanzees regularly eat other monkeys. Gorillas are eating loads of bugs, tons of protein, animal protein and fat from bugs. And also gorillas have a completely different digestive system than we do. We cannot digest the foods that gorillas eat. You can't eat like a damn panda. Right? Pandas eat nothing but cellulose. They eat bamboo all day. We can't eat that unless Beyond Meat processes that cellulose into their Beyond Burgers and then guilt trips, shames, and markets us. You know, guilt trips and shames us into their marketed fake meat products that are made out of bamboo cellulose. We can't eat that cellulose, right? We can't just go outside and eat a bunch of roughage. We can't go eat grass like a cow and digest it and build our body. Right? Gorillas, they eat their own shit. This is a gorilla's diet. This is, this is a true herbivore. This is a true herbivore. Eating a vegan diet. This is what an herbivore diet looks like. This is an herbivore's diet. All right, so Neil Barnard, yes. Gorillas are really big. Gorillas are really, really big. They're also gorillas and they eat their own poo poo, Neil. They eat their own poo poo. <laughs> Just like elephants. There's some elephants. This is how you digest plants. This is how difficult it is to digest plants. These animals have to pull the digested plant matter from the butthole of themselves or other animals and eat it. Elephants eat poo poo. <laughs> <sighs> All right, so, so we do not need to eat our own poop, fortunately, because we have animal foods. Right? Fortunately, we don't have to be burping, farting, and shitting all day like a cow, because we have animal foods. Right? We have those cows that take the indigestible grasses from our yards and turn that into digestible protein and fat that's easily assimilable and that's bioavailable. And those are the only essential foods. The only foods that you can live off of exclusively are animal foods. It has been shown scientifically in 1930. Right? When two guys lived on an all-meat diet for an entire year. Both of these guys who had also already done this all-meat diet, well, Stephenson had spent over 11 years, no, no, I'm sorry, nine years living almost exclusively on meat. Nine years. His health is perfectly fine. Right? This study from 1930 on all meat diets proved that you can live off of an all meat diet. Now you can't do this with any other food. You can't live off of an all sweet potato diet like Dr. Greger said. No, you do all sweet potato diet. You know, sweet potatoes, little slippies, put some chippies in it, some lentils. You know, you know. You can't do that. You can't live off of just chickpeas. You can't live off of just plant foods. And Dr. Barnard who was saying, if you just eat broccoli, you're going to get all the protein you need. Absolute hogwash. Absolute nonsense. But you can't live off all meat. All right, I got some super chats here. What's up, everybody? Let me scroll up. There was a couple super chats that, I, uh, that came before that. Tommy Kelly. What's up, Tommy? Tommy Kelly, $2.99 in pounds. British pounds. Thank you so much for the donation, man. I really appreciate it. We've been having some conversations uh, via like Instagram and private messages. You're always sending me really cool links and stuff uh, to what's going on in the UK. If you guys don't know, Tommy Kelly, his name on YouTube used to be Tofu Tommy. He was a hardcore vegan. I don't know if I banned him on this channel at some point, but I'm pretty sure at some point he had to have made comments <laughs> or lashed out at me before he realized the damage he was doing to his body. Got off that vegan diet. He's doing better. He's getting healed from veganism. The disease of affluence that we call veganism is no longer plaguing Tommy. So Tommy Kelly, thanks, man. Appreciate the support. Uh, you guys know that these streams, all 
get demonetized. The last stream wasn't demonetized, but it was, what was it called? Uh, limited to no ads, right? So I don't know, sometimes they get demonetized. Sometimes they just say limited to no ads because it's not suitable for advertisers. I don't know what it is that we're talking about that's not suitable for advertisers, but they don't seem to like it. These get hidden in the algorithm. When you guys send those super chats, like Judas Romo sent 10 bucks. Thanks a lot, Judas. He just sent a laughing, <laughs> a laughing sticker. That's funny. I didn't know you could send those in super chats. He sent me like this laughing emoji thing. It's like a little cat. So thank you. And then uh, someone else sent a super chat earlier, but it already disappeared above. Thank you for the super chats, guys. We got one from Cole Sullivan. Ten bucks says, do you know any groups, mainly in the U.S., who are doing good work at promoting actual healthy eating in schools, hospitals, and policy, etc., and fix all the disinformation, like veganism? Cole, that's a really good question, man. Um, look, unfortunately, there's not a lot of money in uh, telling the truth. <laughs> unfortunately, there's basically no money in telling the truth. But there are some groups. There is the Weston A. Price Foundation, who I agree with a lot of the things that they say. Uh, they do some advocacy for things like raw milk, like whole unrefined animal foods in the diet. The Weston A. Price Foundation is good. You've got um, we've got the uh, the Charlie Foundation, which is teaching people how to use a ketogenic diet for epilepsy, for drug resistant epilepsy. So you've got them, and then you've also got just loads of farmers, loads of local food producers who are creating, uh, who are making your food, and you can support them. Right? I think that's a really good way to go about it. But as far as advocacy, um, I've got a friend named Niti, Niti Bali. I think you, you pronounce it Niti. Um, and she has an NGO, Farm to Fork Meat Riot. I think that's what it's called. Let me, let me double check. And I hope that's hers. Farm to Fork Meat Riot. by Neeti Bali. All right, farm to fork meat.com. Let's see if, if that's... All right, so yeah, we've got a community-supported agriculture, a CSA group, I and mean, there are a lot of these CSAs, right? So there are these CSA groups that you can join and you can make purchases of bulk, quality, locally raised food from these farmers. So that's a good way to go about it. Uh, Neeti Bali runs farm to fork meat, community-supported agriculture. She works with like Joel Salatin, some other people, so... Um, yeah, you can check that out. Uh, I hope that helps. I wish there were more groups that I could advocate for. Uh, but a lot of this stuff, I mean, a lot of this shit is just, it's, it's highly politicized. Right? Highly, highly politicized. Um, and, you know, as you all know, or as many people know, many people don't. Politics, you know, the way that it works now, kind of a, kind of a dead end as far as uh, you know, advocating good policies through these massive bloated government organizations. Yeah. Hesher, what's up, dude? Hesher's in the chat. Spores right here. She says, what's up? Uh, some little vegan retard says, hello, Tristan's little anti-science echo chamber. <laughs> so we've got a triggered vegan who, you just, you just joined the list of triggered vegans who don't get to interrupt the chat anymore and talk shit. But um, yeah, I got a bunch of people in the chat. What's up? Okay. We got a bunch of the regulars in here. Hip Hop Apotamus. Tommy Kelly is mentioning Natasha Campbell McBride. She does a good job, uh, but she's not based in the U.S. He was asking specifically about U.S. So, yeah, thanks for the super chat. Thanks for the question. Hope I could help on that one. Let's get back to the task at hand. Dr. Neil Barnard completely discrediting himself, helping to discredit the vegan movement, doing our job for us by providing all sorts of lulls and clips to laugh at as these people self-destruct and implode before our very eyes right? blatantly lying about the benefits of a vegan diet blatantly lying about the effects of meat blatantly lying about so many different things let's continue here with dr deal uh, neil barnard eating eating meat and then of course they realize that all the biggest animals are herbivores um and so forth so, but what you accomplish is, is, is wonderful that, that's amazing um, uh, and also you did it for long enough that it's there for you. So if you decide, okay, you know, I, I brought back the sushi or whatever it is, but I'd like to go back into, to not having animals on plates. You're an expert in it. You can, you can get back there if you want to. Um, there was never a person, and I'm not going to speak about you for a minute. I'm going to speak about somebody else. Okay. There was never a smoker who didn't feel better 
lighting up a cigarette. Uh, or uh, a person with an alcohol issue who didn't feel better. Same thing that Gregor did. Um, they know it's better for Same thing that Gregor did. Doing this psychological manipulation to make you associate emotionally eating meat with smoking cigarettes, with taking drugs, and with doing other blatantly harmful acts. Right? Smoking and eating meat. Same thing. It's the same thing, he says. Norwegian Noose, what's up, man? The Norwegian Noose says, Blessings of our Lord, Tristan. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our chat, I think, uh, next week. It looks like next Thursday. So, Jay, so get, guys, make sure to check out Norwegian Noose's channel. He has one of the best channels out there on Eastern Orthodoxy that I've seen. I mean, him and Jay have been doing a lot of really good work in apologetics and uh, for bringing people to Orthodoxy. So I've got to uh, you know, thank Jay Dyer, first of all, for helping to introduce me to Eastern Orthodoxy and the Norwegian Noose. Check out his channel. He's got a lot of good stuff on there. And I think he's actually benefited from a carnivorous diet in his own life. So I think we're going to talk about this next Thursday, which you'll find either on this channel or on Jay Dyer's channel. I'm not sure which one we're going to do it on, but that'll be fun. Um, but we got to back this up. Check out this slimy, snaky, deceptive move by Dr. Neil Barnard, taken straight from the script of Dr. Greger. Right, straight from the script of Dr. Greger, this ghoul telling people to sterilize themselves for the planet, telling men to get a vasectomy, that having kids is bad, that you should feed everyone a vegan diet. This guy is using the same script that that ghoul, Dr. Greger, the greatest bobblehead gesticulator of the internet, uses. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely absurd. And it's so nice that he's completely discrediting himself. So let's see what Brian's reaction is to this lighting up a cigarette, if you want to. Um, there was never a person, and I'm not going to speak about you for a minute, I'm going to speak about somebody else. Okay. There was never a smoker who didn't feel better lighting up a cigarette, mm. uh, or uh, a person with an alcohol issue who didn't feel better having a drink. Um, they know it's better for them to not smoke, or to not drink at all. But when they have whatever that thing is that's tickling their brain, they do feel a little reward to it. And when they're not having it, they kind of miss it. Now, everyone's different. Um, I have to say, for me... And when you don't have it, you kind of miss it. It must be like an addictive drug, right? Eating meat must be like an addictive drug. Just like drinking water. That must be so addictive. Or, or breathing air. Right? Or, or getting outside in the natural sunlight. Right? Or, or, or doing some exercise. Moving your body. Oh, these are all things that are just really bad and addictive. This guy is saying that. Well, if you eat meat, if you crave meat, it's kind of just like craving cigarettes. We all feel good when we smoke a cigarette. We all feel good when we, uh, when we do some drugs, when we shoot up some heroin. We all feel real good, but, you know, oh, yeah. That doesn't mean it's good for us just because we feel good when we eat meat. Terrible argument. And I, I wish I could see Brian's face when he hears this nonsense. As this guy looks him in the eyes and tries to manipulate his audience with this deception. Um, when I got animal products off my plate, I think I went through about two weeks of doubt um, and thinking, what would I miss? But then it was gone. And now not only do I not miss it, um, I don't want to be anywhere near it. it it's, it's like quitting smoking. I, I don't want some tobacco near me anymore. It's just creepy. Um, and for me, uh, f fish, for example, we think of... Um, <laughs> Tobacco smoke is creepy, guys. He doesn't want it anywhere near him. I can't even be around it. It's so creepy. It is so creepy. <laughs> not miss it. Um, I don't want to be anywhere near it. it it's, it's like quitting smoking. I, I don't want some tobacco near me anymore. It's just creepy. Um, he doesn't want meat anywhere near him. He doesn't want meat anywhere near him, right? It's just creepy. To have meat near him. To even see it triggers him. Weird. Really weird. And it's funny, but when you, see, when you see people that get into veganism, they do get like this, right? They don't want to be around their friends and family. Right? It actually divides families. Right? You get these kids. Uh, they go to school. They get radicalized in the schools. They get taught that uh, you should put your pee-pee in the poo-poo and that you should eat vegan food to save the planet. Right? They, they're teaching kids how to put condoms on when these kids are like 10 years old. Right, bringing uh, dudes in dresses and makeup in, in miniskirts to read to them. 
I'm going to teach them all about sexual education. And then they're teaching them about climate change. The climate's changing. The weather's changing. Gaia is angry, right? They teach, they indoctrinate them into this earth worship religion, this eco, this like global eco-fascist rhetoric, global eco-Marxist rhetoric, right? They give them these dehumanizing worldviews in the schools. Then the kids come home completely radicalized. They think that the world is ending because their mommy and daddy won't go vegan. They think the world is ending because mommy and daddy won't give Greta Thunberg all their money so that she can travel around the world and meddle in elections. They think that it's a good thing to go vegan. They can tell, mommy, daddy, I want to go vegan. Just like on the, uh, what was that? That ad, for the Tesco ad in the UK. Oh, my daughter. I love my daughter. And she told me she wants to go vegan. And I made a vegan meal of chutney and, and a bunch of kibble. I feed a plant-based kibble. Give her the plant-based kibble. Now, that's what happens. These kids get radicalized in the schools. They come home. They want to be vegan. And the parents say, yeah, it's cool. It's a good idea. And then these kids are in like high, uh, high school and college. They think they're being rebellious. They get into veganism. This divides up families. It destroys people's health. It destroys their mind state. And it indoctrinates them and opens them up to further indoctrination into all these dehumanizing worldviews that get pushed through New Age religion, right? through, um, through eco-alarmism, through this climate cult narrative that's being shoved down our throats. So they're malnourishing kids and they're breaking up families. Right? The kids don't want to be around their parents anymore. They get all radicalized. There was this video that we watched like a year ago from Instagram and it was this girl, she's like 15 to 17, young high school age girl walking around her house talking about how much she hates her mom because she won't go vegan, how her mom's such a murderer. All right, you've got kids sitting at the dinner table calling mommy and daddy murderers for putting nutritious meat on the table so that these kids can actually grow and develop so that they can have a functioning central nervous system so that they can have a functioning rational mind so that they can actually question these things that are being pushed on them these parents are trying to feed them meat so that they can grow and develop their brains and bodies and they're telling them screw you you're a murderer i don't want to be with you i'm gonna go watch billy irish or eilish uh drink a big glass of black goo and have black ink seeping from her eyes in this like weird demonic music video that gets pushed out there to further degrade our conscience, to further destroy our mentality, our minds, our families, our worldviews. Right? The kids are getting destroyed by this toxic pop culture and the toxic kibble that they're being fed. And this dude that has the audacity, the audacity to tell everyone, we all need to go vegan. And if you eat meat, it's just like smoking. And if you eat meat, it's just like smoking. And for me, uh, fish, for example, we think of um, uh, fish as, uh, as protein. Well, what is it? You know, when I was a kid in the, going into the lakes in Minnesota and we were hooking fish on our lines, we're playing the fish. The fish isn't playing, and the fish is trying to survive. Um, and if you look at, at how people obtain fish, if it's through... And we're not, we're not trying to survive by eating fish, right? We're not trying to survive. They always do this guilt trip narrative. Oh, you don't need to do it. Look at that innocent fish. That fish is just like you. Right? We share a common ancestor, they tell you, which is absolute nonsense. Oh, look, we share a common ancestor with fish and bananas. Complete hogwash. Fish farms, it's frankly sickening. Um, there's a, in fact, there's a new documentary out called, called Artificial that talks about hatcheries and fish farming. It, it will make you not want to eat it. But then the wild caught is even worse. Um, some of them are like taking a lawnmower on the ocean floor and just destroying every species they, they ever could. So, so these bigger issues are there. And when they weigh on us, we can decide, all right, I've been around, I've tried all the different things and, and uh, plant-based diet is always glad to welcome people back. And so he didn't say anything there. It started out with him asking him, what's up with, uh, with eating meat? Is veganism beneficial? All he does is weave a bunch of nonsense rhetoric trying to emotionally charge the situation and make people think that smoking is the same as eating meat, right? That drinking alcohol, that taking drugs, that doing anything destructive, it's just like eating meat, it's completely destructive. Just these weird little pathetic NLP techniques of making you associate meat with death, with cancer. Right? This is all these people have. In no way has he refuted eating meat at all. It just says eat meat bad. 
eat me bad, watch this documentary. <laughs> watch this documentary. And, uh, and, and I'm grossed out by cigarettes, and I'm also grossed out by meat. Right? No real substance here, just discrediting himself by saying something so ridiculous and stupid like eating meat is just as bad as smoking. I appreciate the analogies between drinking and smoking, and I've stopped smoking and stopped drinking. It took me a long time, but I finally have. But I don't think that analogy necessarily plays through into meat. I just don't. And I'm not convinced that completely avoiding meat is the most healthiest thing to do. I think there's people out there that can do it, and maybe they have a genetic propensity to do it. But I've a lot of, had a lot of vegans that have sat in that chair that have come off that. Um, they did it for a few years, and they found that it just wasn't sustainable for them. And so I still am not sure if it's the right diet for everyone. And I know yeah. as soon as you go plant-based, you want to make everyone go plant-based, and it's all the right thing, but I'm not sure. And I'm still not sure of the science. Now, I know you are sure, but I'm just yeah. not sure. And I don't um, consider myself to be completely unscientific, but that, that's just a, a strong feeling I have. Um, two things to weigh in. Uh, one is the science. <laughs> So here's the part where the plant-based doctor completely brushes under the rug and insults the person who just made a valid argument. And hopefully we'll talk about that because we've been funded by the U.S. government to actually test these things. And the data are very robust for the effect of a vegan diet on diabetes, weight loss, cholesterol lowering, that kind of stuff. But in the, the broad scheme of things, um, human being. So it just calls on the science. Oh, the science says, the government says that the science says. Doesn't really cite anything. Just says the government says and the science says. Whether we like it or not, are great apes. Um, and oh, and you're an ape. Don't eat Here ice cream. Because evolution, and they don't though. Eat cheese and they don't have yogurt. They don't have dairy at all. And they are, for the most part, herbivores. Now, there are some exceptions, but the, the great apes are human beings and chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans and bonobos, that's it. Um, they are not dogs, they are not cats, we're, we're not carnivores. The exception is with chimpanzees, you'll see maybe 4% of the chimpanzee diet is they will go up a tree and kill a monkey, which they do by biting into the monkey's head. It's creepy. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, apart from that, they're really herbivores. And <laughs> They're really herbivores, except for the animal foods that they eat. He says it's 4% of their diet. These people have no idea what they're talking about. Monkeys, chimpanzees, apes regularly kill small animals and eat them. They eat so many friggin' bugs all day long. Ants. <laughs> all sorts of bugs. All day. And then check, I like this part. Where he goes. They're really herbivores. And human beings are, are herbivores, but the fact is, we've been such restless herbivores that we were happily living in Eastern Africa, and then we had the bad judgment to leave that area and go into places like New Jersey. Um, so if, if, if we just, uh, of course, you're pushing this really weird narrative of, oh, we used to be apes, we used to just live in Africa, and then we, through the process of the transmutation of species, which has never been observed scientifically, which has never been reproduced or recreated, suddenly, supposedly, we started coding for DNA that didn't even exist again, coding genes that didn't even exist, <laughs> and we became humans, and then it would have been all good if we just stayed herbivores and just stayed monkeys, but then we crossed the Bering Strait or whatever other narrative they're going to weave, and, um, and, and now we start eating meat. Right. We started eating meat and that was where we fell. This is like the, uh, this is the vegan mythology of the fall. It's a completely inverted and twisted theology and human origin story that perverts and twists the truth of the fall. See, it's funny because all of these other worldviews are always trying to account for the fall, whether they talk about it openly or not. Right? These people talk about, oh, look at nature. Nature's so good. Nature's so good. But look at people. People are bad. There's this inherent feeling that we are disconnected somehow from the world around us. People inherently know that we're not the same as animals, which is why vegans don't try and force veganism on other animals. You don't see Dr. Neil Barnard going out there telling the gorillas to stop eating the insects because it's evil. He's not out there uh, protesting the sharks eating the smaller fish, right? But they have a belief that human beings have moral agency. Of course, they can't account for this in their materialistic worldview. They can't account for this in the Darwinist, nonsensical Darwinian evolution worldview. 
which has its roots in like Hinduism, Monism, and secret societies like Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, right? Um, so it's funny how the vegans, they're always trying to account for the fall in this weird, twisted way. Right? So the fall, according to the vegans, is we stopped being herbivores and we started eating meat. And that was just so bad. All right, so we got some super chats here. Stephen Kai, what's up, dude? Send him 10 pounds. We got a lot of English people watching today. The, uh, the Brits are keeping the chat alive, keeping this going. Remember, guys, this will get demonetized. This will get demonetized. So we really appreciate the support. We really appreciate how generous you guys are with these super chats and how you keep these streams afloat, right? You guys make it worth it. Anthony Collins, what's up, dude? 499 says, Tristan, how come you delete the vegan comments? Who am I supposed to laugh at and ridicule? All right, when there's trolls up in the chat, right, and they come in and they completely derail the chat and they talk shit, I do ban people, right? This is not the public bathroom. I'm hanging out in my house. This is my home, right? You're here in my living room with me. I'm not just inviting every retard out there to come pepper the wall here with their nonsense, right? If you're going to play nice, you can hang out. Sometimes I'll let the vegan trolls kick it for a little bit. But sometimes they completely derail the chat, and I just bounce them. So, yeah, man, thanks for the comment. Really appreciate it. I'll leave, I'll leave some of these vegans here for you guys. If the, for some of these vegans coming in here and, uh, and trolling, the, the, they'll be able to stay for the rest of this unless they really annoy me. I'll do my best. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I leave, I leave some, but some of them just annoy me. And I don't look at the chat all the time, right? Like I do these streams, uh, unlike other people on YouTube, I can actually do a stream without just sitting there and feeding on the chat, right? I'm here to give you guys information. I'm here to give you guys uh, my perspective, right? I'm not here just to react to the chat. But if I do see the trolls in the chat, sometimes I bounce them. All right, let's get back to this. So animals are big. Animals eat plants. Monkeys are big, and we're just monkeys, he says. <laughs> Herbivores. And human beings are, are herbivores, but the fact is, we've been such restless herbivores that we were happily living in Eastern Africa, and then we had the bad judgment to leave that area and go into places like New Jersey. Um, and along the way, there were times where we went over the Bering Strait that plants didn't grow. And so we would do our best to eat what we could and survive. Um, but we are still- So we just, we ate meat just as an emergency. Right? It was just an emergency. This is, this is the funny thing about the evolutionary worldview, right? about the, rev the uh, I'm sorry, religion of evolution, Darwinian evolution, the transmutation of species. These people can justify freaking anything, right? You're just constantly making up these narratives of the past, constantly making up narratives about why we are what we are, right? This crazy creation myth without a creator called Darwinism allows this nonsense and the speculation. Herbivores with, uh, herbivores with herbivorous coronary arteries and and when you so we have herbivorous coronary arteries all right so according to these people we came from we came from monkeys we evolved from monkeys they say and some people say oh well, we evolved from monkeys because we ate meat look the high fat uh in bone marrow helped us to evolve our brains and split off from the monkeys as a new species of highly evolved humans with a free will who can then take control of evolution <laughs> that was all because of meat. I mean, both of these arguments are completely ridiculous. For speculation on the evolutionary past is a nonsensical argument. All right, now, it's funny here how he says, oh, well, we, we used to be herbivores, we used to be monkeys, so we should, we should, uh, we should just go back to that. All right, isn't that kind of counterintuitive? Even if you bought into the bullshit evolutionary argument, this dude wants us to go back? <laughs> Re, we're going to devolve back into the highly amazing apes. These amazing apes that just eat plants. Very nonsensical argument. Coronary arteries, and, and when you compare people, almost regardless of any other aspect of their diet, those people who... we got to back it up a bit. When he says... Coronary arteries, and, and when you compare people, almost regardless of any other aspect of their diet, those people who avoid animal products are the healthiest and longest lived. And, I, I'm and that is completely untrue. The people that avoid animal products are not the healthiest and longest lived. And also, to call it an, herbivor an herbivorous coronary artery is so ridiculous, right? This guy has no idea what he's talking about. We have an herbivorous coronary artery. <laughs> Complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. 
He wants you to think your arteries are going to get clogged by fat. Animal foods clog your arteries. It's so bad. You're going to get diabetes from the meat. Hogwash, right? People reverse diabetes. People reduce their inflammation levels, and people are actually reversing their coronary artery calcification through all meat diets. I've seen several people who've posted their results before and after of their CAC exam, and their heart is improving on an all meat, or even not all meat, but ketogenic diet that's based mostly on animal foods and fat. <laughs> all right? That. Look at the, look at the chat. We've got a full on. <laughs> We've got a full on uh, mutiny in the chat here. Full on mutiny. So many people are triggered. When you, if you ever question the religion of modernity, which is Darwinism, people love to freak out. And they freak out because science tells me it's true. I learned in school that it's true. Just like when you learn that a plant-based diet is great. Just like you learn that there's 50,000 different genders in school. You learn about evolution. We all came from monkeys. And now we can control evolution. And now we're gods. <laughs> People are triggered. People are triggered up in there. But um, all right, yeah, let, let's, let's get back to Neil Barnard. We have herbivorous coronary... We have uh, uh, herbivorous... Um, we have herbivorous veins. We have herbivorous hearts. Because science. Regardless of any other aspect of their diet, those people who avoid animal products are the healthiest and longest lived. And, I, and I'm speaking not just about heart disease, but things like Alzheimer's. Complete bullshit. All right, let's throw some facts out here. First of all, low cholesterol levels are very, 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 very highly correlated with neurodegenerative diseases, right? People with high cholesterol do not have the neurodegenerative disease rates that people with low cholesterol have. People with low cholesterol have more risk-seeking behavior, which would indicate that they're starving, which would indicate <laughs> that they are dying for food, that they need food, right? Um, let's see. Uh, the longest living populations have high cholesterol. The longest living populations in Japan eat loads of animal foods, and have high cholesterol. None of these people in the so-called blue zones, which is a total myth, actually eat a plant-based diet. Every single civilization in the world eats meat, eats animal foods, and the ones that have access to high levels of animal foods will self-select to eat primarily animal foods in their diet. People seek out animal foods because we need it. We need animal foods. He's telling you it's going to give you heart disease. It's going to give you diabetes. It's going to give you Alzheimer's. All this is nonsense. As we've adopted this plant-based diet, right? The U.S. diet is like 70% plant right now. We're already on a plant-based diet. We're already on a plant-based diet. We've already evolved. Like all you, you triggered uh, that evolutionary theory uh, believers out there. We've already evolved into a plant-based diet. We've already evolved into the highly evolved ubermensch, like Dr. Michael Greger and Neil Barntard here. We've already gone on a plant-based diet, and what happened to the disease rates? What happened to Alzheimer's rates? What happened to diabetes rates? What happened to cancer rates? Over the last 50 years, these have skyrocketed. And it's not just from diet, of course. We've got loads of radio frequency that we're constantly being exposed to. We've got loads of EMF that we're constantly exposed to. We've got a lot of other environmental toxins that we're exposed to regularly. But, but, I guess it's supposed to be good for us, right? The plant-based diet is supposed to be great for us. Yet when culture is adopted, like is shown in Weston Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, when cultures adopt it, they rapidly degenerate both physically and morally. Um, other things you wouldn't think of as relating to, to diet. Is there they, a definite they direct to. link between Alzheimer's and meat consumption? Um, this is the new frontier. Okay. But it started, it really started in 1993 um, in Chicago. Researchers at Rush University started something called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. They just rounded up people. They didn't tell them what to eat. They just said, what are you eating? And about 10 years later, they started to have enough data to say, suspect number one is saturated fat. And all the, saturated fat is the, the solid fat that's in cheese and dairy, and meat is number two source. Um, plants have almost none of it. 
And the people who ate the most saturated fat had th about three times the risk of Alzheimer's compared to the others. And then right behind it was trans fats, the, the uh, artificial fats that are used in a lot of snack yeah. foods, uh, pretty much the same effect. And then they started noticing that people who ate more vitamin E, which is in seeds and nuts, uh, and some vegetables as well, cut their risk by about half. So anyway. So, here he comes, the exalted epidemiology. <laughs> right, all this nonsense, bogus science, epidemiology, questionnaires that are used, ask people, hey, what do you eat? You can cook. You can cook up the science to tell you anything. Anybody who's been involved in the scientific method, anybody who's been to a university, anybody who's had a high school education, well, maybe 20, 30 years ago, high school education, because now you just get told a lot of dehumanizing nonsense. Right? But anybody who understands the scientific method <clears throat> understands you can't just make blanket claims like, oh, the science says, the science is settled. <laughs> science says veganism is good. Everybody knows, anybody involved in science knows that you can take a hypothesis and you can manipulate data to prove that hypothesis very, very easily. And that's what we see with all this nutrition research, right? The nutrition research that we see throughout the 20th century is complete nonsense, complete gobbledygook, cherry-picked propaganda. That's what it is. It's propaganda. This research propaganda to sell you kibble, right? To sell you plant-based mass-produced kibble. Which has been ongoing now for a couple of decades. And there's still a lot of gaps. But it appears that a plant-based diet is largely protective. And the reason that's important is when I make a list of all the things I don't want to get in my own life, Number one on my list is Alzheimer's because and I, I imagine you've had either family members or friends or relatives um, where you lose everything. So Yeah, it's not pretty. And I mean, we can get to some of the studies later. Okay, again, he hasn't really said anything. He just says, the science says, the science says. <laughs> yeah, but I'm always curious. I mean, are the studies really looking at people like me? who are active, mm. eating maybe grass-fed meat for small portions of my meals, or are they looking at meat eaters in general who are having Big Macs three times a day? I'm always just very curious about the sample size, the study, the length yeah. of it, because I don't think anyone is really talking about someone the way I'm eating and pointing the finger out that this specifically isn't working. It's still kind of very big general chunks of data is the feeling I get. I don't know. Am I wrong? Well, I think you're raising a really important question, which is how much can I get away with? Um, uh, if I can eat meat, can I get, can I just have some? Uh, will, will, it, uh, will it be okay? And if the, if the cow was fattened on grass rather than on corn, will that make a, a difference? I think those are legitimate questions. I'll, although I have to say my whole family raised grass-fed beef. That's all there was at the, at the time. And, and that was a terribly unhealthy pro I mean, you're eating an animal's muscle in, in either case. It is, it is not broccoli. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's definitely not broccoli. That's why we eat it, douchebag. And mussels are a mixture of protein and fat and the occasional parasite that got in there. And that's Wow. <laughs> really what it is. And right. So so it's just a little bit of protein and fat and parasites, right? More of this emotional charging of the language, right? Parasites. You eat meat, you're eating parasites. Dead muscle meat parasites. Dude is completely discrediting himself. Every sentence he says, discrediting himself more and more. I'm actually impressed with Brian and his, you know, his very, very tactful dismantling of these arguments just through asking simple questions. Uh, just like with Dr. Greger, he asks a simple question. And, I mean, unlike Dr. Greger, Neil Barnard actually lets him ask the question. Dr. Greger is just manically stomping out any words that come out of his mouth. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, plan -based diet. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's slippy, shibbies, lance holes, and uh, the, the greatest diet to uh, ever grace the, the face of the earth. It's a vegan diet, and, you know. And, and Barnard, at least, lets him ask the questions. But then, all he does is the sidestepping of the real issues while peppering uh, the conversation with emotional rhetoric. You're eating meat, and it's like you're smoking cigarettes. If you're eating meat, you're eating parasites. When 
as people who watch this channel understand that you're way more likely to contract parasites, to contract food poisoning from plant foods, from leafy green vegetables. The number one cause of food poisoning is not animal foods. It's vegetables. You're way more likely to contract a parasite from those veggies you're eating, from those leafy greens. All right, Luca, what's up, dude? Luca sends uh, five Canadian dollars. Luca Belviso, thanks for the super chat, man. You guys are keeping the chat going, keeping the stream afloat. It says, would you be able to slightly elaborate on the alternative to what they teach as Darwinism? I generally, I'm generally interested in alternative perspective. Yeah, dude, I mean, Darwinism is a creation myth without a creator. The Big Bang is a theory that was promoted by the Jesuits. The Big Bang is a theory that was actually devised by Jesuits, right? And Darwinism is completely unscientific, completely unobserved. The transmutation of species has never been observed ever, right? There are many different ways to debunk Darwinism. If you look at uh, DNA and RNA, right? Uh, you know, coding for genes that don't exist, right? So they'll say, oh, well, it's mutations, right? Well, you could also look at um, uh, what they call abiogenesis, which is a fancy scientific jargon term for the creation of life out of nothing, right? Rocks, inert minerals, inorganic inert dead matter suddenly is animate and alive. They say, oh, well, that's, that's abiogenesis. There's absolutely no, <laughs> there's absolutely no observation of life being created out of non-living material ever. All right? So if random chance and evolution and random mutations and, uh, uh, and random occurrence brought about life, why can't we create life intentionally in a lab? <laughs> you know, there, there's so many ways of looking at, um, what I would suggest, if you want to look at a really good refutation of Darwinism, read Father Seraphim Rose's book, Genesis, Creation, and Early Man. The second half of this book, might even be more than, no, it's actually most of this book, is refuting evolutionary theory from many different angles. Evolutionary theory is very unscientific, it's unproven, unobserved, unrepeatable. It is a grand narrative, creation myth without a creator. Right? So what is an alternative to what they teach as Darwinism? Creation. This is created. You don't get something out of nothing. <laughs> so, I don't know. A lot of the people who came up with Darwinism are theists. They believe in theistic evolution, where it's like God created the universe because they need a creator. They need something to create something out of nothing. And then he just set it off like a clock, right? He wound up the clock and then set it out there. And then life evolved. And so theistic evolution gave birth to atheistic evolution, which is completely unjustified. And our entire like modern scientific worldview is based on this house of cards on this foundation of sand. Let's see, we've got any other super chats here. All right, so yeah, check out that book if you want to look at that. Back to the task at hand. See, oh, you guys, you guys get so triggered if I, if I mention the nonsensical nature of evolution. But the chat can't handle it. The chat just has to go on and on about evolution. And that's fine. We can talk about this more on another, on another stream. But right now we're talking about Barnard. We're talking about, we're talking about Barnard's completely incoherent debunking of eating meat. It does have nutritional value. I mean, I can survive on it. Right? And it does help me build muscle in, in my Not, No, I don't think so. Not at all. Well, there's, no. Um. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, let's go back. And muscles are a mixture of protein and fat and the occasional parasite that got what in there. What a zinger. And that's really what it is. And, right, but and it does have nutritional value. I mean, I can survive on it, right? And it does help me build muscle in my not, no, I don't think so. Not at all. Well, there's no. Um. <laughs> uh, not at all. He's just he's let him. He, he's just giving him the rope, and Barnard's wrapping it around his neck, fastening it up to that door hinge up at the top there. He's just giving him more and more rope, and the dude's hanging himself every time. Wow. No meat doesn't. No, no. <laughs> Even though there are thousands of people out there right now living off of exclusively meat. There are people who have been doing it for over 20 years, like Charlene, I think it's Charlene Anderson, and Joe Anderson. They raised their kids on an all-meat diet. She completely remitted all symptoms of her Lyme's disease. 
using an all-meat diet and got her life back. All right, there are thousands of people who are doing a full-on carnivorous diet, which I'm not saying everybody should do that. But some people find themselves in a situation where it becomes almost necessary after they've wrecked their gut with these whole food plant-based diets like this dupe is promoting. When they listen to guys like Dr. Greger, or Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen, their gut gets wrecked and they end up finding that all they can digest is meat, that all they can digest is animal fat and protein. <laughs> and this guy has the audacity and to respond like this. That got in there. And that's really what it is. And, right. And it does have nutritional value. I mean, I can survive on it, right? And it does help me build muscle, I mean, in my no, no, I don't think so. Not at all. Well, there's no. Um, first of all, you can't survive on it. Um, if you try to eat nothing but yes, meat. Yes, you can. You, you remember the, the English sailors who all got scurvy? Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, th th that, that's sort of the Atkins diet taken to an extreme, and somebody realized, wait, 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 meat doesn't actually have vitamin C, guys, and that's where the limes came in. Um, okay. But, Lime. but, but I mean, there's a lot more to it. There isn't any fiber in that diet whatsoever. There is protein, but the whole idea that, that meat jealously guards protein is not true. I mean, there's protein. If, if you, you ate 2,000 calories a day, roughly, I'm going to say unless you're training, in which case you're eating 3,000. Yeah. Um, if you ate 2,000 calories of nothing but broccoli, not that you would ever do this, but if that's what you did, you would get about all the protein that you need, that the government says you need, plus about 90 extra grams. And if the next day you ate nothing but lentils, you would get all the protein you need, plus an extra 100 grams. Plants have enormous amounts of protein in it. But to, to make it short and sweet for anybody who's just tuning in for just this one bit, a healthy diet is four things. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, or the legume group, beans, peas, lentils. Every single one of those foods that he just mentioned are non-necessary foods. If you try to mono-eat any one of those foods, if you try to live exclusively off of any of those foods, or if you even try to live exclusively off of all those foods in a well-balanced plant-based diet with Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen, you will still deteriorate and die if you're not supplementing heavily with all the things that you're not going to be getting. <laughs> vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and you should supplement with vitamin B12. Uh, pe people can get low, and I mean meat eaters get low, but I think everyone should supplement with B12, and that's something we can talk about. But that's, that's to me, is a healthy diet, and meat doesn't add anything to that at all. All right, so there, there you go, guys. You should just eat 2,000 calories of broccoli to get all your protein in. Because meat doesn't have anything you need in it. Even though we have essential fatty acids and essential amino acids, those essential amino acids and essential fatty acids are available in the perfect balance to make them bioavailable and digestible for humans in animal foods, not available in the proper balance, not digestible from plant foods. But he says, meat bad. Meat bad. All right, we got another clip here from Barnard. I think comparing meat eaters to alcoholics and smokers is, is a little bit of a cheap shot. Like, no, you, you're right, you're right. Meat eaters uh, have much more problems than alcoholics do. Alcoholism can cause uh, liver disease. And... See Brian shake his head? I, I mean, this is, this is where he really doubles down. This is where he really, really doubles down and it gets so ridiculous. I mean, this is, in some ways, it's worse than the Dr. Greger thing. Dr. Greger is... He's a great example as he you know, babbles incoherently and gesticulates wildly and manically and stomps out the, uh, the interviewer. He was really good for demonstrating just this you know, starved, craven, gullum vibe that people get when they're starving themselves on these vegan diets and when they buy into this ideology. It's like this possession almost, right? Uh, that's a great example. Gregor's incoherence is a really good example. But Barnard's intellectual dishonesty here is unparalleled. You know, this guy reaches new levels of vegan sliminess in this clip right here. I think comparing meat eaters to alcoholics and smokers is, is a little bit of a cheap shot. Like, no, you, you're right. You're right. Meat eaters uh, have much more problems than alcoholics do. Alcoholism can cause uh, liver disease and colorectal cancer and breast cancer, but meat causes a far greater range of problems. I still think the comparison's a little unfair. It's a great analogy. Now, why, now why is it unfair? Um, I'm going to assert... Yeah. that alcohol, people are not drinking it for um, logical reasons. They're drinking it because it works on the brain. And despite the fact that it, it does a, a variety of neuromuscular 
things to you. You can't drive anymore and, and, and speak coherently and walk straight. The reason people drink it, drink it is because it, sooner or later in the brain elicits dopamine. Same is true with cocaine. A lot of dopamine, yeah. Correct. Same is true with every drug of abuse. And the same is also apparently true uh, with meat <laughs> and with dairy. Um, and with Netflix and any other behavior. I don't know if you want to compare that to alcohol. Though. No, I do. Okay. I'm, I, I, I'm listening. I, 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 I do. Okay. Now, See, he tries to give him an out. He tries to give him an out. He's like, okay, this is ridiculous and you sound like a fucking moron. And he, and he gives him a little more rope. And he doubles down. Throws another knot around that neck. And say alcohol can take... Uh, it, it can cause much more dramatic situations. Every drug of abuse is different. And, and I've often wondered, why is it? So, uh, there, there are a lot of curiosities. Why does one person like beer, another person likes wine, one, another person likes their scotch with a mix, and they're very particular about how their drug gets into their brain. And it's also true that many lives have been destroyed by it, and some lives may have been enhanced by it momentarily. And th that's all true. The drugs are all different. But in my view, it's a good idea to look at certain foods as drugs. Uh, we see this with sugar. Um, on day one of life, I'm talking about a newborn baby. If I do a heel stick to draw a, a drop of blood for a blood test, if I take sugar water, dribble it into that baby's mouth, a minute or two before I stick him, he cries less. Because the sugar went to the brain, it triggered the release of opiates in the child's brain. Fast forward uh, into adulthood, sugar will still affect that Adult, now, adults' brain, they don't know it. They just like it. Um, cheese liberates, as you digest it, opiates that attach to the very same receptors in the brain that heroin attaches to. Um, they're called mu receptors. Um, in, a, in, a, in a significant way, the same as heroin? I mean, am I going to get anywhere near that dose? You, you'd one, have to work at it to get the same dose. No, no, I have some experience it, with heroin as well, so you're speaking to someone who knows a lot about these drugs. It's, it's not enough to get you arrested. Okay. It's, it's enough to make you really like cheddar. I mean, why would anybody else like something? So he's saying cheese is like heroin, guys, because you have receptors for opiates in your body. Now, your body actually creates natural opiates. When a woman's given birth, hormonally, um, she's going through all sorts of amazing uh, things. And if you're to measure certain natural opiates in the blood, when a woman's given birth, she has those natural opiates flowing through her. So because we have opiate receptors, opioid receptors, and some foods will hit those receptors, or the mu receptors, rather. Because some foods will hit those mu receptors. Therefore, eating meat is heroin. Eating animal foods, eating cheese is like heroin. Complete nonsense, right? And, and of course, you know, you have, you have the other side of this argument, right? Let's, let's, let's flip it. Let's assume, uh, we'll take it from, the, uh, from some of these other people on the other side who would say, well, look, you have, um, you have, opioid receptors, therefore, therefore, we should take opium, right? It's, it's a funny thing, right? Just because we have receptors for something doesn't mean we need to be constantly flooding them with these substances, right? Having opioid receptors doesn't mean, oh, look, we evolved to be smoking opium, <laughs> right? But it's pretty interesting that, um, that he would claim that just the fact that certain foods will hit pleasure centers in our brain and in our body, that that makes them bad. Right? What about when you drink water? If you're really parched, if you're really thirsty and you drink water, aren't you also going to see some physiological changes in the body? Does that make it bad? When you're eating sugar, like what is he advocating for? He's advocating for a diet based on carbohydrates, right? Essentially, that's what, that's what these people advocate, a diet based on sugar, carbohydrate. He says sugar is a drug, but what about all these other sources of sugar which you're eating on a vegan diet is that not bad very very inconsistent very incoherent it smells like old socks i mean let's let's face it it's because it has a box i mean let's, drugs. It's, it's not enough to get you arrested okay. it's, it's enough to make you really like cheddar I mean, why would anybody else like something that smells like old socks? I mean, let's, let's face it, it's because it has a drug effect. Um, the, the drug I'm speaking of is casein, C-A-S-E-I-N. That's the, the protein in... It's a protein. It's not a drug. It's a protein in milk. Milk. And when it came out of the cow, the, the, what comes out of the cow's udder is this white gooey mixture um, that has protein and sugar and 
He tries to make it sound gross. And a Milk. Of <laughs> Gooey and white. That, that, yes, it, it does have a calming effect on the calf. And when you turn the milk into cheese, the casomorphins, casein-derived morphine-like compounds, are concentrated in the cheese. Now, it's only a trace. Yeah. But it is, it's, the traces are enough to affect your GI tract, which is why you, people get constipated from cheese, and enough to affect the brain. Right. And there's also, it tastes good, and there's a lot of cultural conditionings, and like you said in some of your speeches. The and also, it tastes good, and it's got all sorts of nutrients in it that you're not going to find in any plant foods. It tastes good, and it's got all sorts of fat and fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients that our body requires. It's got digestible, slow digestible protein that can help us to rebuild our body and our central nervous system. It hits on certain pleasure receptors in our brain and actually calms us down a little bit because it tells us that we're satiated. Right? So that we don't have to be waving our hands around like a wildly gesticulating schizophrenic like Dr. Greger while we're starving on a vegan diet trying to tell ourselves that we're not dying. They started sticking it on hamburgers and now everyone started consuming it. So. Yeah, there's a lot of that too. I mean, is there a drug trace in there? I don't know. And yes, a lot of things can be addictive, but you know, you could also tell me that, you know, when you when you don't study Islam that you're also, you know, going down the wrong path as well. Um, but we can test these things. Um, and the way that you can test it um, is I can give you an injection of naloxone, um, which is an opiate blocker. Mm -hmm. And for it, cheese. Oh, this is for the cheese thing. Um, yeah. yeah, or to okay. take a, 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 a really good example. Yeah, um, uh, let, let's just get sidetracked here. and Let's not go back to the task at hand. Let's just get completely distracted here. <laughs> take a chocolate lover. And I don't mean a person who appreciates fine Belgian chocolate. I mean a chocolate binger. Yeah. A person, you give them a tray and it's gone. Um, if you, in, in a controlled setting, set up an IV and you run naloxone into their body. Nalo naloxone is what's marketed under the name Narcan. Yeah. It's, it's a heroin. Oh, I know. Antagonist. Yeah. Yeah. So a guy shoots up on the street. And so meat's like heroin, you, guys. If you inject Narcan, you'll save his life. Mm -hmm. So you give this not to a heroin addict. You give it to a chocolate addict. Most amazing thing happens. You give them a tray of chocolate, and they'll take a bite. They'll set it down. You say, have some more. I'll have some. No, no, I'm, go ahead. It's just not calling to me. It, it knocks out the the narcotic, the opiate effect right. of the chocolate. So it's still the taste, same taste, same mouthfeel. What I'm going to argue is the taste and mouthfeel of chocolate and cheese and a steak is secondary. You're getting a brain effect, and your brain then associates all that other stuff, the smell, the whatever, with what happened in the brain. If you take away that brain effect, none of the rest matters. Wouldn't that also happen with my porn habit as well? You can give me some of that narcs alone and it'll top my porn habit, is, but that doesn't mean porn is going to kill me. I don't know if that's done through opiate receptors. I don't either. But you understand. So if we give you a drug that knocks out your opiate receptors, <laughs> then you won't want to eat as much chocolate. Therefore, meat is a drug and is bad. This is his argument. This is his argument. He's so nonsensical, it's ridiculous. You, you can try it. You understand my point. Is it just because it does that blocking doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to kill <laughs> I'm like, I'm dumbfounded, right? Oh, no, no, this no, is no, worse I, than I the Gregor. Say, I didn't mean to say that this is worse than Gregor's is necessarily dangerous. Okay. I'm only alleging that when people eat cheese, they are physically attracted to it and it is addictive. Um, and had I said that 50. Cheese is addictive, guys. Cheese is addictive. Meat is addictive. Uh, hey, drinking water is addictive, guys. Ble uh, breathing is addictive. Exercising is addictive. <laughs> wow. 15 years ago, people would have thought that was ridiculous. But that was before we... And, and it's not as strong as heroin. The strongest of the casomorphins, there's a whole group of them in cheese, the strongest one is, is called morphoseptin. And you can pull it out of cheese. And it has about one-tenth the brain binding power of pure pharmacy-grade morphine. So... Um, it's there. Yeah, look, your cheese IP is strong. You've got to be one of the, the most researched guy in cheese. Well, the that. reason I did that, Are we were doing... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing convincing in what you just said. There's nothing coherent in what you just said. You just spouted a bunch of nonsense, dude. In these research studies, yeah. um, people with diabetes would come in. They were overweight. They were on insulin, everything else. They would come in, and their lives were transformed because we would take the meat and the cheese out of their diets. But... The cheese habit would live on. They would say, the one thing, Dr. Barnard, I crave, I would just love some cheese. And you think, why? 
what is it about this yellow goo? If it was nutritionally, if it was any worse, it would be Vaseline. Why do they want this stuff? And so I started investigating, and I wrote a book called The Cheese Trap uh, because I, it's such a goofy world. And it's an interesting world. You yeah. can get in a car here in London and go out to Cheddar. You know, how many people even realize there is a town of Cheddar? Yes. Um, that's where it started. You know, and you can go that's to That's how good cheese is. They name entire cha- uh, towns after it. That's how fucking amazing cheese is. They named their place. They named their town after that stuff. Bear. There's a little crossroads called Camembert. And um, it's a funny, goofy world all based around this yellow drug. I'm with you on the cheese. We can definitely send cheese down the river. It's with the blinking. It's with the weird blinking. Look at the all blinks. based around this yellow drug. I'm with you on the cheese. We can definitely send cheese down the river. I'll back you on that one, Doc. <laughs> you're sticking uh, with meat, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm just so not sure. The, There's a little bit of the, lean. The fish is the one. And check out the, uh, the, the cross-armed posture. He knows he's being exposed here in certain ways. He's a little bit uncomfortable in his posture there. He's got that closed-up posture, the closed-up body language. <laughs> you got to wonder if he knows how stupid he sounds. When you want. A little lean meat protein, I don't know if it's going to be the yes, same as... Yes, but you can't call it protein. I can't. No. Okay, because it's not. Because it's not. Um, There's no protein in meat. There is protein in meat, but people like to say, uh, in wow. fact, sometimes you go into a okay. wedding. Yes, but you can't call it protein. I can't. No. Okay, because it's not. Because it's not. Um, There's no protein in meat. There is protein in meat, but people like to say, uh, in fact, sometimes. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm pretty sure Brian Rose sees exactly what's going on at this point. I think he's a little bit disheartened at how. Stupid this guy assumes Brian is, right? He's treating him like he's a fucking moron. No, but you can't call meat protein. You can't call it protein, dude. <laughs> he's like, yeah, because there's no protein in meat. And he knows this guy's so full of shit. You want a little lean meat protein. I don't know if it's going to be the yes, same as... Yes, but you can't call it protein. I can't. No. Okay, because it's not. Because it's not. Um, there's no protein in meat. There is protein in meat. <laughs> but people like to say... Uh, in fact, sometimes you go into one of these uh, little restaurants things, you go into the store and they say, pick your rice and noodles and pick your protein. And by protein, they mean meat. Um, but meat is not protein. Protein is a macronutrient. Meat has some protein and a lot of fat in it as well and the occasional parasite and whatnot. So it's, it's muscle tissue, it's not protein. Okay. Oh, it's just parasites and fat. <laughs> it's parasites. It's not protein. All right, so here we are again with this kind of plant-based rhetoric, right? Plant-based. Plant-based meats. It's not meat. It's protein. Where am I going to get my protein? Well, you can get your protein from beyond meat. You can get your protein from fake meat. Because <laughs> meat's not even protein, man. It's not even protein. <laughs> man. All right, so... Brian, he's been very, very nice, right? I mean, he's, he's obviously he's a professional, right? He's not trying to call this guy out too hard. Uh, but I got to throw a little bit of a thank you out there to Brian Rose for exposing these guys, for asking the right questions, and just giving them just enough rope to hang themselves over and over and over again. Right, Neil Barnard, completely self-destructing, completely nonsensical statements, so inane. Just full-on propaganda nonsense. And these people are look people in the plant-based diet movement, right? Which now it's plant-based diet movement because big industry has come in and they want to rec- they want to market you all sorts of products, right? So it's not vegans now. Now they're talking about plant-based. It's plant-based, which is meaningless, right? Plant-based doesn't mean anything. <laughs> just like Dr. Greger saying, oh yeah, you know, it's like a little bit of meat here and there, just like smoking a cigarette every once in a while might not do anything so bad, as long as you eat mostly indigestible slippies, chippies, and lentils, as long as you eat mostly plant-based foods. Plant-based means nothing. It's a fluffy, empty marketing term for starvation. Right? It's slightly less starvation than full-on veganism. Kai Green is now claiming that he's on a plant-based diet. Kai Green, vegan bodybuilder, Kai Green, is on a plant-based diet now. (laughs) Because plant-based is just a marketing term. It doesn't mean friggin' anything. They're trying to get us to think that no matter where it comes from, protein is the same, but this is very, very untrue. I want everybody to remember 
the bioavailability of protein in animal foods is unparalleled. Right? You're not going to find any plant foods with highly bioavailable protein in the right amino acid ratios. Very, very important to get the right ratios of these amino acids that we need. And it just happens to be that the amino acids we need are in the perfect ratio in animal foods. Perfect ratio in animal foods. You don't have to food combine at all to get all the nutrients you need. If you're eating enough fatty, ruminant meat, you can live off of just that. You get all the amino acids you need in an easily digestible form with no anti-nutrients in animal foods. Plant foods come with certain amino acids in a completely different ratio than our body can use them. Right? So you have to eat much more of these protein sources as well because it's locked up in a matrix of indigestible fiber and anti-nutrients. But animal foods are easily digestible. Those are the only foods you need, the only foods you can live off of exclusively. This dude says if you ate all broccoli, you get all the protein you need, which we all know is completely untrue. We see so many people going into this vegan movement and getting their health, their mind, their body completely wrecked by the advice that these guys give. And they're telling you to go plant-based. There's lots of money in plant-based. Lots of money in plant-based. Which brings us to our next topic. Kai Green. Kai Green has gone. Let's see, I gotta make this window a little smaller. Kai Green has gone plant based, y'all. Kai Green, after a week on a plant based diet, is showing some major gains. Some major plant based gains. I mean, in this picture right here, He's looking like he's up on that, that Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen diet. <laughs> he's on that Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen bowel movements diet. Kai Green, professional male stripper, winner of many sanctioned eating disorder pageants, a.k.a. bodybuilding competitions. Obviously, this is a photoshopped image. Kai Green with that big old bodybuilding bubble gut. But Kai Green's been pushing the plant-based diet now, too. How convenient. The Game Changers movie comes out, which is basically a two-hour pea protein isolate advertisement telling us that we're going to perform better and have bigger boners. Your boner is going to be bigger. I, I'm not joking. There's a section of the film, The Game Changers, where they talk about it's going to give you bigger boners. We talked about this in a stream like a year and a half or two years ago. Because this film has been in production for like five years. They filmed it once, and then they scrapped it, and then they filmed it again when James Cameron came in and gave him millions of dollars. <laughs> but check out Kai Green. Kai Green's going vegan. Kai Green on his social medias, representing that plant-strong diet. Going strong into the weekend. Broccoli in peace. <laughs> Kai Green. Made a tweet, said, I saw the Game Changers and I'm thinking about going vegan. Then he put out a video of him. Let's see. Where'd that video go? It's on his YouTube channel. Going vegan, why not? Going vegan, why not? You. Uh, so we're at the office, we're eating up, and uh, this is like my day four, no? Listen, the days are kind of bleed into each other, so it's kind of difficult for me to kind of keep track. But not even a week. Still continuing my vegan challenge here. This is really cool. Let me tell you what happened. I just recently have discovered that there's a place not too far from where I am. I actually my office space is here in um, Williamsburg. And interestingly enough, everywhere I go, I'm actually discovering more, you know, vegan options that are available to me that I probably would have never even knew. Wow, what a surprise! Yeah, let me just open my fridge here. Oh, yeah. Yo, yo, look look at this. We actually found these cool vegan patties. Oh. Oh, I don't know what the company is. Oh, oh I don't know what the company is. Yeah, it's made from pea protein isolate, you know? Pea protein isolate. The biggest pea protein isolate manufacturing plant is owned by James Cameron, who put out the film The Game Changers that Kai promoted on his social media, right? People... When you're Kai Green, you got a couple hundred thousand followers on social media. Let's see how many followers he's got here on Twitter. 285.7 thousand followers. When you make a tweet to promote a product, that shit ain't cheap. It's not cheap. 
Right? When you put out a tweet to promote, where's that game changers tweet? Dan Hevia says, really interested to hear your perspective as time goes on. I watched Game Changers the other night, and Blood Test alone had me considering big changes. I watched it too. Def got me thinking. And I believe, if anything, that was the intended goal. So I said, why not? Let me give it a try. So far, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. I feel good. That was October 26th. That was like day one. right? Uh, was it day four, he said? He put out that other video on the 29th. Let's see. Where is the first one, he says? Day one, plant-based diet, October 23rd. Okay, there we go. So it's been about two weeks now since this plant-based diet. Check it out. Once I saw this, I was like, WTF, tags game changers. This new Netflix doc is insane. All right, so a tweet advertising the game changers. This shit ain't cheap. You know, his agent's doing well. He's finding them work, right? Hoeing them out. Hey, shit, it's better than humping, you know, oranges and grapefruits. It's better than doing, uh, you know, like gay for pay porn stuff like Kai's done in the past. Um, so he's promoting the game changers. Is Kai Green making a switch to a plant-based diet? So here we go. Several posts promoting the game changers. I just saw the documentary on Netflix, below, bro. Man, the blood plasma you guys did with NFL players got me thinking. Tagging Lightning Wilkes, the guy who, it was James Wilkes, the guy who made the Game Changers documentary with all the money that was given to him by James Cameron. So this isn't cheap. This is an advertising campaign for the Game Changers. Advertising campaign for Beyond Me. But, um... We actually found these cool vegan patties. We got these cool vegan patties, you know? Got these cool vegan patties. And I got some quinoa, got a little bit of good fats here, some um, mushrooms, and some kale, and uh, some cashews, if you didn't see. Got some cashews here. And, you know, I'm, and it, it feels good. So I am continuing this thing. Yeah, it feels good. You, know, you can tell the guy's totally not into it. He can give a shit. He's probably eating like three plant-based meals this whole time just to take a picture or video of it, post it up on social media. You're going to eat a bag of cashews, dude? Come on, this guy, the amount of calories this guy has to eat to maintain the ridiculous amount of weight that is on his body, the unnatural amount of weight that's on his body, the amount of calories he has to eat, he would freaking wreck himself if he ate a fully whole foods plant-based diet. All right, so we all know he's not really going to stick with this long term. All right, this is a marketing campaign, which... We're going to flesh out even better in a minute here. After I hit on these super chats, what's up, guys? We've got a bunch of super chats coming in. There we go. we got a super chat cascade coming in. Thanks a lot for the support, guys. You, uh, you guys know that this stuff, we always get demonetized. We always get hidden in the algorithm. And you guys really do uh, You guys really do help when you send them super chats. we got Make More says Meat Man Bad. That's right, man. Meat Man Bad. Ball Man Bad. Eat Meat Bad. Science says Don't Deny Science. Go vegan, cause evolution though. David sends two bucks. What's up, David? Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for the donation. I always see your name popping up there. The super chats, really appreciate it. Ian Jones with 20 pounds. Guys need to eat meat, buy land, and make a big family. So many people looking for purpose in life when their great-grandparents had it all figured out. Um, you know, I mean, eating meat, making families, very, very important. Hey, if you're going to make families, you're going to need to eat meat. And uh, you know, I mean, unfortunately, the family has been, the family unit is under really heavy attack. Just like our food sources are under, are under attack, the family in general is under attack. And so eat meat, make families. Thanks a lot for the donation, man. I appreciate that. Um, if you guys got any questions, you guys want to do a little Q&A, feel free to send them super chats over. Or if you just want to support, uh, we want to thank everybody for supporting via PayPal as well. There is a donation link down below in the YouTube video. If you enjoy this content, please think about supporting. It really does help. As we get demonetized, hidden in the algorithm, and demonized by media that are constantly pushing all this nonsense BS on us. David sends another five bucks. Thanks, dude. Thanks a lot, man. Anal gains says, will you block me from your channel? <laughs> I love, I love these, uh, these vegan... <laughs> I love these vegan profiles. We got Anal Gaines over there. Anal Gaines. He's always telling me to debate him. No, you will not get blocked. I'm sorry. If you send me a $100 super chat, maybe I'll block you. 
How about that? Lord Back sends 10 Canadian bucks. What's up, dude? Says, hey, Tristan, I was wondering if being carnivore... I was wondering being carnivore if you hunt. Um, and I've noticed you like hip-hop. What's your favorite hip-hop? All right, so, Lord, you want... I think you may have uh, forgot a word in that question. Thanks a lot for the donation. So, being carnivore if you hunt. If you hunt, pretty freaking cool. <laughs> pretty freaking cool because you're going to be getting some of the most quality meat, some of the best healthy food. And you're going to be stocking up your freezer with that and not having to buy anything. So, yeah, I mean, hunting for a carnivore diet, great. You're going to want to add more fat if it's very lean, right? If you're doing venison, venison doesn't have a lot of fat. If you're in Australia and you're eating stuff like kangaroo meat, it doesn't have enough fat. So you might want to add things like butter, tallow, um, other fat sources. Eat the marrow. But yeah, dude, hunting is great. I don't know, you're in Canada, so uh, you probably have good access to food. Good access to meat. Oh, he's asking me, do I hunt? There's not a hunting culture where we live, right? So the food that we eat is cultivated, right? There's not a big hunting culture. There are, there's deer. There are animals like tapir. Uh, there's spectacled bear, the Andean spectacled bear. And, uh, but there's not a big hunting culture here. Although people do shoot deer over in the valley across the way. Um, it's illegal to like sell meat and stuff. It's a, the hunting culture sucks down here in, uh, in Ecuador. But well, people do it. I don't do it. If I did do it, I wouldn't talk about it on the internet either. But I don't do it. Because we get really good quality cultivated meat from things like sheep, cow, goat, donkey. Actually really good meat. Sounds funny, right? But donkey meat is actually really good and has great fat. Um, so yeah, thanks for the super chat, dude. Much appreciated. And uh, let's see. Favorite hip hop? Let's see. I don't know, man. I mean, I like I like hip-hop but most most hip-hop super degenerate right most of it sucks these days uh so i like some old stuff i don't know i mean i used like back in the day when i was in high school i used to like some of the wu-tang stuff some of the early Wu stuff was cool there was even some like some kind of semi-woke stuff in a lot of the early Wu, like that song impossible that track that was pretty good i like like dell the funky homo sapien hieroglyphics and some of the like earlier uh bay area stuff um I don't know, man. Most most hip hop is very degenerate, though. But there's some good stuff. I don't know. Those are a few. I used to like Mac Dre back in the day. <laughs> All right, hip hop apotamus. What's up, dude? Five bucks. He likes hip hop. Says vegans think science is appeal to authority and BS biased studies. They don't understand that science is a method and experiments can be done wrong. Exactly. Simply saying science says blank does not make it true, right? Simply saying science says we evolved from monkeys doesn't make it true. Simply saying that inanimate matter and rocks suddenly became living creatures does not make it true just because you say science says it, right? So science, unfortunately, scientism gets used as basically a religion now, right? Um, science has replaced religion for many people, and they put all their faith into what the television tells them science says. So science says that 95% of people who watch TV will do whatever the person on the TV tells them to do if he first says that science says they should do that. And I mean, really, it's just like I'm just eating. So um, I really don't know much about trying to say and doing anything more than enjoying my meal right now. So. That said, you get the what's going down. That's the 411 of what's happening with me today in my office space. So, on that note, do what you will. Peace. Do what you will. Throwing out that Crowleyan. Do what you will. <laughs> Thelema shit. Do what you will. That's funny. People don't even realize what they're saying half the time. This, this, this gets pumped out through pop culture. Got Kai Green repping Crowley there. <laughs> That's funny. Um... All right, so Kai Green is on a plant-based diet since October 23rd. He said that was day one. And check it out, guys. Already, Kai Green is a total expert on plant-based dieting. Look at this amazing ebook written by Kai Green. Look at this ebook, plant-based dieting, $4.99. So if you guys want to learn how to get just as jacked as Kai Green, if you guys want to learn how to do it right, Please buy Kai Green's ebook where he's going to tell you how to do what he just admitted 
he doesn't know how to do. <laughs> Kai Green already selling an ebook. Less than two weeks. Less than two weeks <laughs> on a vegan diet. This is ebook. This is impossible. You are so weak from lack of meat on his uh, on in his journey. He can't even get proper marketing copy on this. It was put up so hastily. What a joke. How could these men and women be so strong with nothing? How can you survive with only grass and grain? You ask, exasperated. The wise chef's grin turns upward. You will soon see for yourself. You're going to escape this stranded island. What kind of marketing copy is this? This is so bad. Plant-based dieting. My research and experience with a vegan diet, which he admitted a week before this came out, he had none. <laughs> Male and females can do it. Food recommendations. Science behind it all. But it's 18 plus pages too, y'all. 18 plus pages. <laughs> so Kai Green is promoting the plant-based diet now and making them plant-based gains. Then plant-based money gains. Selling an ebook. <laughs> it's over 18 pages, guys. It's 19 pages. <laughs> All right, let's let's see sneak peek. Here on this deserted island, your only hope is to leverage the grains, legumes, and soybeans to regain your strength. However, on mainland, you will be burdened with choice. <laughs> the truth is that you do not need to be so dichotomous in your decision. There are great personal and ethical benefits to increasing your vegetable, grain, and fruit intake. Still, you need not throw out the benefits of lean, animal-based proteins together in a balanced approach. You can have the benefits of the modern world and the wisdom of the stranded island. So <laughs> this I, I don't this is this seems like some like Chinese click farm came up with all this marketing copy. Um this is great. So he's admitting here that vegan is a starvation diet. And but also it's completely nonsensical because on a stranded island, a deserted island, you'd somehow have a bunch of grains, legumes, and soybeans. <laughs> he's gonna tell you how to get all these things. So on a desert island, you're gonna have soy, pumpkin seeds, peanut butter, tofu, chia, cashews, edamame, spinach, quinoa, pea protein powder, seitan who Kai's obviously down with. Tempeh, lentils, chickpeas, and chia seeds. That's what you're going to eat on a, on a stranded island. You're not going to get fish. You're going to kill animals and eat it. That's what you're going to have. But don't worry, guys. Starving yourself will get you jacked just like Kai Green. Just like Kai Green. You're going to get so jacked. <laughs> Got some more super chats. What's up, guys? Ah, Scott says, My steak is plant-based, so I am plant-based. That's right, dude. I eat a plant-based diet. Right? Unfortunately, I can't digest most of these vegetables. I can't digest most of these grains. I feel like shit. My body doesn't function as well. My immune system doesn't function as well when I'm eating a bunch of these plant-based starvation foods like Kai Green says we should eat. But I do feel a lot better when I eat my plant-based diet, which is based around plants that are cultivated in my local area. And I use... Shh. I use animals... Hold on. That's on Jessica's computer. And, all right, they just stopped. <laughs> Sorry. The incoming call on like a internet phone thing. But my plant-based diet is based around all plants that are grown here. No imports are required. Uh, we actually use a bioconverter a four-legged bioconverter called a cow or a sheep or a goat or a donkey to convert that into edible protein and fat on site without the necessity of any mined materials. No destructive mining is necessary. No, um, no pesticides are necessary for the creation of this plant-based meat and ribs and steaks and fat and kidneys and heart and all the delicious parts of the animal like the tongue. As well, lengua tongue is one of my favorite cuts of meat. Very underrated. This plant-based diet that I eat, which is based around mostly animal foods, uses local plants and doesn't require any transport of those plants, any destructive mining, any machines, any giant corporations to import and export them. It doesn't require any of that nonsense. That's my plant-based diet. So I'm going to have to make an ebook about how to do a plant-based diet right. It'll be over three pages. 
Ah, Scott says, FDA says pea protein gives dogs heart disease. Us too? Yeah, probably. Right? When you see what it does to the animals, it's a pretty good indicator. Right? You feed these animals kibble, their health gets destroyed. Right? So, yeah, man. Good good point. Chris Casanova199 says, Tristan, look into Hog Mob 7. He's from Sacramento. Hog Mob. All right, man. I'll look up Hog Mob. We'll see what that is. I'll look that up. We'll maybe touch on that on a future stream. Um, all right. So Kai Green straight up says this is a starvation diet, but don't worry. When you get back to the real world, you can keep it going. You can keep starving and just eat a little bit of lean meat, a little bit of animal food. What's up, guys? Your boy here, Kai Green, a.k.a. Mr. Getting It Done. I'm sorry to be spitting at you. Uh, so we're at the office. We're eating up, and uh, this is like my day four. No? Listen, the days kind of bleed into each other, so it's kind of difficult for me to kind of keep track. But I'm still continuing my vegan challenge here. This is really cool. <laughs> is Gregor on every single YouTube channel for vegans? Gregor's got to be on every single one of them. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another video. Thanks for coming on the channel again. Really appreciate it. Today, over. we're talking about Kai Green, an IFBB pro bodybuilder, personal trainer, artist, and actor, and has come artist. third at Mr. Olympia in 2011. An actor. So I love it. As soon as somebody goes vegan, they become like the greatest dude ever. He's an artist and an actor. Look at his art. Look at Kai Green's art. Dressing up in S and M gear, looking like a degenerate juice head. Look at Kai Green's totally not degenerate art. You guys could check out some of his performance art using grapefruits and towels. I would highly suggest not looking into that. Here's some more of Kai Green's art. Here he is dressed up as a, as a female Mortal Kombat character. He's got that Melina look. <laughs> this is dressed up as fucking Melina from Mortal Kombat. Ugh. And placed second at Mr. Olympia in 2012, 13, and 14, and won the Arnold Classic in 2016. And the reason I'm talking about him is because Kai Green went vegan after watching the documentary The Game Changers, which I've talked about on this channel, went to the world premiere, did a whole review on it, responded back to Joe Rogan's comment <laughs> about the film. Of course, like the vegan, vegan YouTuber starter kit is like really, really corny adulatory praise video about the game changers uh dr gregor worship video preferentially having dr gregor in front of you so you can fawn over him and drool over his ghoulish physique uh and then also you need a response to joe rogan right a response to joe rogan telling him why he's wrong and why everyone should go vegan and then um yeah i'm not sure what, what else do you need in the uh, vegan youtuber starter kit uh, other than complete mental illness and narcissism and the vegan lifestyle if you haven't seen it yet you can watch it on netflix i'll have a link down below on where you can rent it if you don't have netflix and you can also watch my review but basically this documentary shows the benefits of eating a plant-based diet and the effects that it has on athletic performance and it also features another ifbb bodybuilder nimai delgado in the film who has never eaten meat at all in his who grew life. up eating animal foods as a vegetarian Life, not even once so definitely check out the film if you haven't seen it yet whether you're vegan whether you're not if even if you're skeptical about it give it a shot it's a really great film and if you're just on here because you're a hater then you can hit that dislike button twice and get out of here all right so kai green this huge guy very successful bodybuilder in the past very popular dude just went vegan after watching the film kai green used to kai green just went vegan what watch all these vegans talk about he's been on he's been on a so-called plant-based diet which we actually know is bullshit he's probably still eating plenty of animal foods who knows how many meals of lentils and kale this dude actually ate before he said fuck that shit i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm just gonna keep doing a few tweets every week about how plant-based is cool i'm not gonna show myself eating this shit anymore All right uh these vegans are now gonna act like kai green built his entire physique and his entire career on veganism Right, they're they're gonna attribute all of his every single achievement Kai Green's ever made is gonna be due to veganism now. Now that he's said he's on a plant based diet. 
very popular dude, just went vegan after watching the film. Kai Green used to be a huge meat eater back in the day. He was sponsored by a brand called Muscle Meds, which have a carnivore branded supplement, which he did a whole ad for. All right, so this is- Wow, the oh, so man, so he's just totally, totally switching over to plant-based because he knows that the science is behind it, right? The science with the line down the S to get him those gains with the line down the S at the end type of guy that we're talking about a huge meat eater and so i found a clip here showing him meal prepping and how he used to eat a few years ago and would basically put rice chicken broccoli and sweet potatoes in the tupperware and would eat that throughout the day i can take a bag of a frozen vegetable it can be string beans broccoli throw it in the microwave sprinkle some broccoli in here bacon or i can have it in my microwave container in one meal so pretty all-around balanced meal nothing processed and pretty simple and straightforward uh, definitely not vegan but for the most part I would say he was pretty conscious mm -hmm. within his knowledge at the time about what he was eating now here's a clip that he just posted on Instagram about his update on the vegan lifestyle check it out so we're at the office we're eating up and, check it out uh, this is like my day four no Listen, the day's kind of... Isn't it sad that this is like, this is vegan inspiration, right? This is how, this dude thinks that this is going to inspire so many people, right? Like, let's let's parade around this juiced up, unhealthy bodybuilder who looks like a, like a freaking inflated black balloon. Like, this Kai Green does not look healthy in any regards. And these guys, this guy, Bananiac, let's see what he's even talking about. Is he, is he like a health advocate? But it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how unhealthy bodybuilding is. It doesn't matter what reality really is. What matters is promoting your stupid-ass vegan diet. Look, Casey Neistat's vegan. <laughs> Greta Thunberg, vegan. Wow. Those vegan inspiration videos. <laughs> this is supposed to be inspiring to us. Eat into each other, so it's kind of difficult for me to kind of keep track. But... We're supposed Don't to get hyped on this. Right? Look, here. this is really cool. Look, look I'm sitting here eating enough, food in an office. Go, I'm actually discovering more, you know, vegan options that are available to me that I probably would have never even knew existed. Let me show you what happens. We actually found these cool vegan patties. Oh Things man, amazing. we even found these cool vegan patties, patties, patties called on. Beyond um, Meat patties. This is actually really good. I got here some seitan. I got some quinoa. Got a little bit of good fats here. Some um, mushrooms and some kale. And uh, some cashews, if you didn't see. Got some cashews here. And, you know, I'm, and it, it feels good. So I am continuing this thing. And I I'm continuing this thing. See how he doesn't even look at the camera when he says that? He doesn't even look at the camera. He can't even, he can't even tell his lies with his eyes into the camera. I mean, really, it's just like I'm just eating. So um, I really don't know much about trying to say it and doing anything more. Then enjoying my meal right now. So as you guys saw, inside that meal, he was eating quinoa, seitan, kale, and mushrooms. Very similar to what he used to eat before, just veganized it, swapped out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've got that vegan inspiration there. We got this other guy. This guy's a like a natural bodybuilder, I guess, too. Look how he's, look how he's trying to flex his traps and his shoulders on camera. Um, I think he's... I think he's calling out Kai for being like a vegan sellout. Like it's, I don't know. Let, let's see what's going on here. This guy's name is Brian Turner, 346,000 subscribers. All right, let's see what other kind of content he has. I think he's like a so-called natural vegan bodybuilder, right? Meaning he's like a vegan physique guy. He competes in natural physique competitions. Who knows if it's natural or not? I'm not going to comment, but his physique is completely achievable naturally by anybody. Um, Let's see what he has to say about fake veganism and make money. Right? Because fake vegans are out there trying to make money. And the real vegans, the real vegans who should be making all that money, are going to get hurt. Poor real vegans. So, if you don't know, Kai Green um, has never been vegan, right? So, just recently he posted he said he's going to do a seven-day <laughs> trial of veganism. Um, and that was about seven days ago, maybe eight now. But about two or three days ago, he came out with a, video, uh, a book, an ebook called Plant Based Dieting. Look how he. He's like, and if you've been following him on Instagram, you've been seeing him post a lot of, you know, uh, like vegan stuff. <laughs> Why do all these right? vegan bodybuilders like him and John Venus and Leo Venus, they're always. They set up the camera and they like. 
flexed in that area. <laughs> it's like always, let's see if he does that for the whole video. We're not gonna watch the whole video, but let's see. Very hyped up, he's been like stoked that he's vegan, right? If you go and look, yeah, you'll see- Let's jump forward. If you were to purchase this book, I would assume that you were hoping that you would learn how to eat plant-based while gaining muscle and being a bodybuilder and whatnot. But then this, this page in the book rounds up the whole book, you know, kind of finishes the whole book and says, actually, you shouldn't go 100% plant-based you should have a balanced diet of both. Now I have so many things to say about this. First off, the first thing that comes to my head, forgive me, I'm all hopped up. When did he put his, did he put his sweater on when he realized that he was gonna have to maintain a very awkward position for that whole time if he wanted it to seem like he was uh, as jacked as he was trying to frame it? There he goes, he's putting it on now. You should try out the vegan thing, it's awesome, man. I'm feeling great, everything's, you know, Everything's awesome. I just watched the Game Changers. It's crazy. My mind is, you know, open and different. And, you know, I'm really excited okay. about this. Get my so, shirt on. Isn't it funny how mentally ill these bodybuilder people are, dude? They're so fucking narcissistic and vain and obsessed with how they look. Look, he's going to get more comfortable when he puts his sweater on. I've been very, very excited for him. Because now well. he doesn't have to if you've been looking flex his traps section, into the maybe thing like Leo too. Venus was. A lot of people have been <laughs> that isn't from animals. So right there, it just shows that he... He came up with the book just because he saw money in it. And that's the whole point of this video is I just, mm. I, I've seen this happen time and time again where people see that veganism has a big trend, it's a big popularity, a new documentary comes out. People are excited because they're like, you know what, if I, if I, if I mess with this plant-based thing or vegan thing, people are gonna come in and, and, and I'm, it's gonna be relevant. There's gonna be a lot of new things, a lot of new followers. And that's exactly what you've seen over there. His comments are just filled, 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 filled with vegans being like, we're so stoked for you. I think it's important for me to call this out just because as soon as someone who is well known switches to a plant-based diet, we all jump into support. And I think that's awesome. But I think it's also important to let people know when you see something like this, you need to take it with a grain of salt. You don't, you don't just believe it all full on. <laughs> this is so pathetic. All right, so he's jealous that Kai Green is selling an ebook. Instead, you should go buy his Beyond the Week ebook, Eat Vegan or Die Trying Recipe Book. Look at that recipe book. If you buy this recipe book, you'll look like him. Like he did on that one day from that one angle. You'll look like him. And then you can be out of breath when you start your videos because you were getting a pump so that you could put your shoulders and your traps up in front of it and try to make it sound look real big. <laughs> this is sad. All right, so he's mad. He doesn't like that Kai Green is making that money. Look at this dude's whole thing. He's selling Vivo Life Protein. He's got his Vivo sweater on. Slinging that vegan ebook. But don't support Kai Green. <laughs> Kai Green. Oh, what a degenerate. Look at these, these are so gross. These bodybuilders are really like, I don't know. And bodybuilding is, is a pretty crazy world. Pretty wild world. But yeah, don't, don't listen to Kai Green, he says. He's a fake vegan. I'm a real vegan. I'm the real vegan. <laughs> All right. So there it is, guys. Kai Green is vegan. He's already got a vegan ebook in which he admits that veganism is a starvation diet. <laughs> but it's cool because starvation is good for the planet and stuff, right? It's good for like global warming or whatever because of like evolution or something. Now, anybody who's watched this channel for long enough knows that there's a lot more going on here than just marketing you food. There's a whole lot more going on here than getting you to eat plant-based kibble and the roots of this the roots of the desire to get us on a highly centralized consolidated and controlled food supply and to be, feed us kibble this goes back a long time so we've got here for the history buffs out there national security study memorandum 200 implications of worldwide population growth for u.s security and overseas interest this is a policy paper from Henry Kissinger. It's also called the Kissinger Report. It was declassified in 1989. I'm sure a lot of people were upset that it was ever declassified because it's become under uh, it's become a major talking point for a lot of us who've been pointing out this depopulation agenda for a long time here. So in the table of contents, you can see this report talks about world demographic trends, the rising population. Right, the population is increasing in many of the areas where Kissinger and the State Department saw economic growth possible, right? They saw resources that they could take. 
and they didn't like the fact that the third world's <laughs> population was growing. So people like the Rockefeller family, the Rockefeller Foundation, people like Maurice Strong, people like Al Gore, people like Henry Kissinger, very concerned with world population increasing. Very, very concerned with keeping the population down. And they talk about here ways to decrease the population using economics, using food, using many other methods of control. So <sighs> the plan to decrease the human population is something that is right there, right out there in the open. It's something that's been happening for a long time. And it's something that's been published in policy papers and white papers, and these people's biographies, and people like uh, people like Bertrand Russell, who wrote the Scientific Outlook, talk about the need to decrease the population and create a total control grid to save the planet. Like we got to save the world by decreasing the population. Of course, this is a national security issue for Henry Kissinger. They talk about using food, using food programs in order to manipulate the, pop the population, using the control of resources to manipulate the population, and weaponizing things like aid. Right, so this is at USAID.gov. USAID uh, historically used by intelligence agencies within the U.S. to influence policy globally. USAID kind of like a fake NGO, one of these fake NGOs that's tied in with CIA and with other intelligence agencies and is used to implement policy in other countries. You know, so we talked about the first global revolution. This is another book that I highly suggest you guys look into if you're wanting to learn a little bit more about this global warming propaganda this climate change propaganda, reading this book, The First Global Revolution, or just checking out Jay and my stream that we did on The First Global Revolution, the Club of Rome, this think tank, this big think tank, that essentially says in this book, they lay out all of the problems of the world. Right? This book that has a foreword or a quote, starts off with a quote from Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who we started this stream with Prince Philip who says we need to depopulate the world. He's calling himself a prophet in this thing and talking about how great the Club of Rome is and how we need to decrease the population. So this book, very, very interesting. They talk about using using the threat. Let's see, what page is that on? Using the threat of climate change global warming and the like to create an enemy because people need a common enemy they need a common threat to force them to unite so this whole book is about what types of threats can work to help people unite under for a common cause and talk about the power vacuum the power vacuum that happened after certain wars that just weren't enough And the resolution to this problem is, i got to find the page. I think it was like page 70, I think it was page 70 something. But the problem can be resolved, they say, by getting us to all come together to fight against ourselves, right? to frame human beings as the enemy of mankind. We need an enemy to unite the people we need a common vision, right? The period of absence of thought and lack of a common vision, not of what the world of tomorrow will be, but of what we want it to be so that we can shape it, is a source of discouragement and even despair. How simple it was or should have been for France, Great Britain, and their allies to mobilize against their common Nazi enemy. And it was not obvious during the period of the Cold War that the Western nations should accomplish a, dipl a diplomatic, economic, and technological mobilization against the Soviet Union and its satellite countries. And so we need a war, they're saying. And there's limits to democracy. Right? They say democracy is not good enough. It's kind of problematic. We need a common enemy. People and nations are beginning to agree to take the next steps together. This is 1992 this was published. Right? The problem that they say it's the human population. Too many people. How do we get rid of these people? 
The common enemy of humanity is man. Page 75. Yeah, I was right. I thought it was 75 or 76. In, search for a common, in searching for a common enemy against who we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. In their totality and their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which must be confronted by everyone together. But in designating these dangers as the enemy, we fall into the trap which we have already warned readers about, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. Right? So the people who are promoting these plant-based diets as a way to save the world, the people who are promoting this climate crisis war narrative, groups like the Club of Rome, see you as the enemy. <laughs> They've created a whole propaganda structure to weaponize you against yourself. Right? And this dehumanizing diet that they're trying to feed to us, this kibble diet, is meant to destroy us. Right? Much like much of the toxic pop culture that we're exposed to, it is meant to destroy us. These are weapons of warfare, economic growth, population growth. Population growth is seen as a negative thing by these eugenicists who do want to control human breeding, human reproduction. And of course, if you control what we eat, if you control our resources, you can control the population. So we talked about this last week, how media has been promoting sterility, right? And even euthanasia. So we've got Yahoo News, barometer of despair, birth rate falls as millennials feel, fear rather, climate apocalypse. So this fake climate apocalypse that they've been, they've been brainwashing us into, traumatizing you with images on the TV, right? showing you fires and saying, oh, look at those fires, they're because you because you were born. The planet's dying because of you. There's not enough resources, they've been telling us in the schools. Since we're little kids, well, there you go. Millennials are not having kids. Birth rates fall in the West as millennials fear climate apocalypse. This is the propaganda they're pushing, this, they're pushing out there. They're not responding to legitimate grassroots concerns by millennials they're telling you what you should be concerned about they're telling you you shouldn't have kids they're telling you climate change is going to kill us all a poll by washington post and the kaiser family foundation in september found that 68 percent of respondents 18 to 29 say they are afraid of the effects of climate change and 63 percent of teen respondents believe future generations will be harmed a great deal they're telling you don't have kids don't have families right so that when you're old when you're old and decrepit and your social credit scores are running out you have no one to take care of you then you'll willingly give up all that carbon that you've been jealously hogging in your body and you know try to upload upload yourself into the cloud or whatever they're going to tell people and so that you can live forever in the computer you can live forever in google and so that when you're old, you got no one to take care of you, you just lay down and die. Right? They're destroying communities. Rural communities have been thoroughly destroyed, especially by big ag over the last like 30, 40 years. Right? Small family farms are being systematically eroded, which is why we're always talking about the need to help out and promote and support small family producers of food. Right? Supporting real small family farms, very, very important. Climate Darwinism makes disabled people expendable, <laughs> says Forbes. Talking about all oh, these disabled people are uh, all these useless eaters out there, is what they call us. Useless eaters. Right? This is social engineering. Facectomy reversal operation day, right? Here's some, here's some of the victims of this social engineering. I just took out the headphones. I hate wearing headphones, but I'll put them on just so we can listen to some of those. <laughs> So we can check out this video. I haven't seen this yet. Someone sent this to me. Tommy, Tofu, formerly Tofu Tommy, actually sent this to me. Vasectomy reversal operation day, our baby journey. All right. You have all these dumbass millennials getting vasectomies, sterilizing themselves because they think it's good for the planet. 
because they think it's going to be so lame to have kids, right? Oh, kids are so expensive. I won't be able to spend that money on beer and drugs. I shouldn't have kids. Look at these vegans vasectomying themselves. <laughs> the comments are funny. Lots of other people who've given themselves vasectomies as well. Lots of other vegans. Vasecta vegans. Let's check these guys. Wow. What's happening, Free Game? We are coming to you live. But not live. <laughs> you jumped and everything. From our home in London, um, I must say it is a very, very messy home. Mummy made loads of mess, and now we're having to make her tidy up. It was not me that did all this mess. Who was it? Yes, this boy. We've been at home, we've been getting ready to go out. It's a very special day, something very special is happening today. But, of course when you're going out, it's the perfect time to make a mess, isn't it? Because then you have to try and tidy it up before you leave. So yes, today, today is a very special day because this is the day of the operation that we've been telling you about. So the operation I will be having to give back my powers so I can create children again. It's my vasectomy reversal operation day. It almost sounds like, like makes it sound like a cat. These people mutilating themselves. <laughs> willingly mutilating themselves. I wonder, I don't, I'm not really sure how many people are actually able to reverse the vasectomy, but that doesn't seem like something that's like a sure shot. I'm pretty damn sure that not everybody who tries to get a vasectomy reverse actually is successful. Right? And, and how sterile or how fertile will you be on a vegan diet too? And we all know that fertility declines dramatically on a vegan diet. <laughs> Calendar day, doesn't it? Vasectomy reversal operation day. Yeah, but what's even more important than that? I'm coming down here with you, mummy. What's what, more important? What's even more important than that is look at my socks. Yep. Check out these socks. But how's that? What's even more important is look at these socks. Look at these consumer products that I bought. Look at me. I bought cute socks. <laughs> Vasectomy reversal. Sock got a day on the calendar. <laughs> Wearing stupid socks day. These socks actually have a tog rating. No, oh, I bought Look cute socks. They are well covered and I've had them myself. Not Look at that. that. Look at that. I'm a, I'm a 35 year old child. Look at that. Look at these socks. They're all soft. Uh, calm down. It's not real fur. <laughs> it's not. Never do that. Fur belongs on the animal. Yeah. She had a go at me a minute ago. Did I? Yeah, because I took a other pair of warm socks. Yeah, I got two of them and he took the other. You're taking them to the hospital. I'm having an overnight stay and they said slippers. We don't have slippers. So I thought, if needs be, mm. that's the best option. Talk about support. Oi! <laughs> no, I'm really supportive of you. I yeah. mean, yeah, it's a really special day. And you've been a bit, I wouldn't say you've been nervous, but you've been very quiet today. Yeah, he's about to get his dick cut into. They're about to slice his testicles. And what are they going to do, like solder your freaking tubes together? Of course he's nervous. <laughs> and he's on a vegan diet, so he's fucking starving too. Which is really strange, guys. Normally alarm bells for her. This man is not a quiet person. How dare you. I guess I've just been trying to tune into it coming up. It's been a very long journey to get to this point, And now the day's here, I'm like, okay, wow. And I think there were some things I didn't know about. I was like, I've never had a general anesthetic. So I don't know what the procedure is and what goes on. And so, yeah, I had a lot of questions and I asked you and you knew more about the situation because you know people who've had operations. And so, yeah, I just wanted to know really what happened, like how long you're in for and when you wake up and what happens. And I started reading all the stuff last night just to really engage my mind with it. And yeah. Are you scared? I'm not scared. I'm one of these people, I don't, I don't take time out very well. I'm like, I want... <laughs> your heartbeat is very high as well, and that's yeah. probably just your norm. This will definitely check whether you're actually human. <laughs> 36.3, that's high. And your heartbeat is 53, so it's not too, it's not too high, which is good, because fitness people, they always have theirs below 50, just a little. Too healthy yeah. to be one. So did he say it went well? No, he said everything was perfect and it was like easy and everything was... Because obviously, really? as far as an examination is concerned, normally, like when we had the appointment before, they examine externally. Yeah. They just feel that way. But he does all he says the best examination you can have is once he's in there. And so he said everything was fine, got it done, no problem. Wow. Wow. Everything was fine, we got it done, no problem. I've got my vasectomy. <laughs> I'm going to pop out some babies now. Let's go make some babies. Man, it, it, these people, this is so sad. I'm mean, sad to see people starving themselves with a vegan diet, right? Hopefully their kids are not vegan. Uh, 
but then they're going to try to conceive. If they're both on a vegan diet, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe, maybe in a year, somebody remind me to check back up on uh, family freedom and see how they're doing in their smart city coffin apartment and see if the vasectomy reversal worked. Uh, somebody mentioned, let me scroll up here, Claudine. Claudine, who I, I think, if that's the same Claudine who I spoke to in the past, that's awesome. I hope all's well. I think this is Claudine, who's a former vegan. Uh, really nice lady. Says, uh, High Carb Hannah's, got, uh, High Carb Hannah's man got a vasectomy reversal, and they are struggling to have a baby. No shit. I mean, a lot of these vegans struggle with fertility issues. A lot of women who go on a vegan diet lose their fertility completely until they start eating animal foods again. Um... <laughs> so vegan vasectomy reversal but look it, it, it goes beyond just getting people to get vasectomies right? it goes beyond just decreasing the birth rates what's really cool about all this rhetoric about plant based diets carbon dioxide and all this shit what's really cool is we get to pay more for everything we get to pay more for all goods and guess what big oil big ag big pharma Love the idea of carbon taxes. Right, the Fortune 100, the big banks, the international financiers, these are the ones who are actually pushing this rhetoric, and they want to tax everything. They want this to tax everything. This is one of the front lines in the fight against climate change, a real-world lab of sorts for carbon capture and storage. And some of the biggest names in oil and gas are leading the charge here. Why are big companies like Shell and Total interested in this research? Um, why are big companies like Shell and Total interested in this? Is because they stand to make a lot of freaking money off of these schemes. These giant companies are going to sell you on the idea of building carbon capture factories. They want to build massive machines that will supposedly suck carbon from the air and deposit it underground. Where are they going to deposit it? In water. And that water will have to be kept underground in those aquifers, meaning the water below your feet, you're not going to be able to drink that anymore because it's going to be used to capture carbon. This is how freaking insidious this shit is. Right? Oh, save the banks to save the world. If we can just have carbon taxes, then we can save the world. And guess what? Big oil is all about it. We're showing that we can make the industry more commercially competitive, as well as promoting social and environmental responsibility. The idea is simple. Shoot the carbon underground to help the environment, then use it to squeeze more oil out of wells. We could be injecting enough CO2 right now to be neutral. We have the capacity, we have the wells, we have the expertise. It makes a boatload of jobs. It's like, it is the immediate answer. Facilities the like- immediate answer. <laughs> Big oil is gonna save the world, guys. Climate change is scary stuff. It seems every week there's a new report or study from a different group basically saying the same thing. Running out of time, capiche? Politicians argue about how to reduce our emissions, but economists mostly agree. The best, cheapest way to reduce carbon emissions is to put a price on them. Well, if you care about the economy, then carbon pricing is absolutely the best way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon pricing is used in more than 50 places around the world, including Canada. Almost half of Canada's emissions come from burning fuel for electricity and heat, while about a third are from transportation. Each year, Canadians produce over seven... <laughs> They're calling carbon taxing now? They're calling it carbon pricing. Right, this is like Orwellian doublespeak, constantly uh, bombarding us with these nonsensical ideas. They're telling you that, uh, yeah, it's pricing. We've got to put a price on carbon. No, no, no. This is taxation. They want to tax you. It's a giant freaking scam. It's a giant global scam to create a global government, a global technocratic government that's going to quantify everything you do and price it using carbon. All right, the social credit system, we've been talking about for a long time here, the social scores, the social credit system that's being uh, used in China that companies like Google and these big tech companies are beta testing over there in China, that's going to be used globally. This is the plan. Right? Unless enough people wake up to this and stop this shit, they're going to try to use this globally to reduce carbon emissions by making everything more expensive. <laughs> so they tell you, the world's ending. 
You are your own enemy. You are the enemy of the planet. Your children are toxic sexual enjoyment byproducts. Put the pee-pee and the poo-poo instead. Don't have babies. Don't eat meat. Drink cockroach milk and oat milk. Right? They tell you having babies is bad. They tell you we've got to eat grandma. They tell you we've got to get rid of the useless eaters. They tell you cannibalism is maybe a good idea. They tell you all this shit. They tell you you're bad for the planet. And then they tell you, well, maybe we need euthanasia. Right? Maybe, maybe euthanasia should come back. Euthanasia and assisted dying rates are soaring. But where are they legal? What's the difference between euthanasia, assisted dying, and assisted suicide? The main difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide is who performs the final fatal act, says Richard Huxtable, professor of medical ethics and law at the University of Bristol. They're seeding this idea more and more. They want us not only to stop having babies, but to willingly lay down our lives. And look at this double-speak, crazy Orwellian language about suicide and killing yourself. And euthanasia. Global warming, LSD, and euthanasia. Bring on the death panels. Salon Magazine, salon.com from 2013. Heat waves and a frayed safety net have made old age uncomfortable. Sci-fi talk about end-of-life drugs make sense. How can anything survive in a climate like this? A heat wave all year long, a greenhouse effect, everything is burning up. It's from 2013, this article. Edward G. Robinson utters the complaint in the opening scene of Soylent Green, just before his character, Sol Roth, leaves the tenement he shares with Charlton Hessen to pick up his ration of Soylent crackers. As he waits in line, food riots erupt. They look a lot like the food riots that exploded around the world the week Heston died in 2008. See how they're programming you? Bring on the death panels, they say. Let's have a soil and green future. This isn't just fluff. This is social engineering. They're telling you what to think about your place in the world. They're telling you what to think about the world. Mike Moore, what's up, dude? Sending two... What, are, what is that? Is that euros? Vegans need to pay CO2 tax on their fart. Yeah, and the CO2 tax thing, is what a joke, right? Thanks for the super chat, man. Thanks, everybody, for sending super chats today. Uh, if you guys got any questions or if you just want to support, always appreciate it. Had a couple really good streams last week. Loads of super chats. There's Garland Farms. Garland Farms, thanks for the super chats the other week, or was it last week? He started a cascade of them super chats. That was really nice. Um, so... <sighs> Bring on the death panel, says Salon. Bring on the death panels and the Soylent Green. State-assisted mass suicide would receive its first realistic treatment in British author P.D. James' 92 novel, The Children of Men, which reversed the older narrative of overpopulation. They're saying this is a cool idea. State-assisted suicide. And as they tell you, of course, that the world is dying, that there's nothing good for you in the world, that we're all just pink monkeys that evolved from pond scum. We need to come together and kill ourselves to save the world. Isn't that their job? Advocates to revive campaign for voluntary euthanasia at NSW. Voluntary, though, guys. Look, the euthanasia is going to be voluntary, the media says. Voluntary. Don't worry. It's voluntary. For now. Right? Just like Neuralink. Don't worry. It's going to be voluntary. Said... Elon Musk, voluntary in euthanasia. Nearly half of Norwegian church members support euthanasia. The fake Norwegian church. The heretical Norwegian church. They have a mark shift in hot-button issues such as same-sex marriage and abortion. Abortion, abortion, same-sex marriage. Save the planet. Put the pee-pee in the poo-poo. And euthanasia is a great idea. This is what they're telling us. They're telling us euthanasia is a great idea. <laughs> All right, so this plant-based diet, what's the difference, right? Malnourishing people slowly, feeding them foods that will sterilize them, effeminize them. Or why not just give them a hot shot, right? Why not just uh, euthanize them? All right, so the propaganda is getting ridiculous. More and more of this stuff. 
is getting pushed on us every single day. It's like ubiquitous everywhere. Ridiculous. But anyways, like we always say here, we're all about eating meat and making families. We're all about speaking out against this degeneracy. We're all about promoting what is true, what is good, and what is real. That's why we speak out against this nonsense. That's why we call out these jokers. That's why we call out these dupes like uh, Neil Barnard, Dr. Neil Barnard. Where'd Neil go? Let's find Neil Barnard. Oops. We got Neil right here. Neil Barnard who says, eating meat is just like drinking alcohol. He says it's just like smoking cigarettes. And he doubled down on it and said it's worse. Meat eaters are worse off than alcoholics. Completely dishonest. Completely discrediting himself. Discrediting his own position. And we all know that you can live exclusively off of animal foods. You can live exclusively off of animal foods with no plant foods at all. But if you try to eat just plant foods, you're going to need lots of supplements. You're going to need... Shit, I mean, you're probably going to need some pharmaceutical drugs because you're going to be depressed. You're going to be anxious. Low cholesterol increases. People with low cholesterol, let me put it this way. Switch it around. Violent crime, people who commit violent crime, violent criminals, murderers, violent criminals, when their cholesterol levels are measured, there's a high correlation between high cholesterol and violent crimes. High correlation between risk-seeking behavior, suicide, and low cholesterol. <laughs> um, and fertility rates decrease, obviously, among the vegan population. Look how many of them are sterilizing themselves willingly. Not just with the diet of the soylent slop and the kibble, but getting vasectomies. That's like a, it's a sacred rite in veganism to get a vasectomy. So this worldview, this diet, very, very destructive. We need animal foods. Animal foods are the only foods that we absolutely need. All else is extra. All else is extra. In fact, you can live exclusively off of meat. And a lot of people are finding that eating an all-meat diet or a diet that's primarily based around animal foods with select carbohydrates here and there for performance or just for preference, a lot of people find that their body, that their immune system, that their mind functions way better. A lot of people who get their whole uh, life wrecked by this vegan nonsense that gets pushed on us, a lot of them find that a carnivorous diet reverses the disease of veganism for them. The side effects of veganism being rotting teeth, decreased bone mineral density, decreased muscle mass, mania. <laughs> Look at all these manic vegans. Emotional disturbances. And just general insufferability, right? It, it's just kind of insufferable to be around these veganjelicals. But these people are reversing all of the symptoms of the disease of veganism by eating meat. Some people find that they have to eat all meat in order to be able to digest their food properly. I'm not saying everyone's got to do that, but it is possible for you to reverse the negative effects of a vegan diet and animal foods are an instant cure for the disease of veganism. All right, guys. Let's see. What else we got here? Um, let me pull up here. Got my uh, my Instagram here. Check it out. For my most recent post. Actually, I think Jessica might have posted something else since then. Um, <clears throat> my post this morning was hidden. Here's one of my favorite pictures, though. Isn't that beautiful? I love that picture of Gregor. Um, this post was hidden. It might be sensitive or offensive content. Oh, look at that. Real food, animal food. So Instagram is hiding images of real food. This is a sheep's head with some tripe on top of it. This is just a picture of the market here in Ecuador. Right? Anywhere in South America, you can go to a market, and this is what it's going to look like. Instagram says this is offensive and should be censored. Crazy. All right. All right, so the next Keto and Carnivore Collective, our group coaching is starting November 17th. So we've got about two weeks till we're starting. Uh, you guys can sign up. There's going to be a link in the description to our website. You go to the coaching section of our website. You can sign up for the Keto and Carnivore Collective. It's our group coaching. We do it every month, almost every month. Sometimes we take a few off because uh, you know it's nice to decrease the workload sometimes. We do two live interactive voice chats per week. So that's, I think it's like eight meetings per month that we do. And... 
you're looking to set up a dietary and lifestyle habit foundation that you can maintain long term in order to achieve vitality, energy, to regenerate the body, or to just enjoy life. You want to have better uh, cognition, mental clarity, improved immune system function. Check out the Keto and Carnivore Collective. We, uh, we're probably going to be sponsoring some ex-vegans for this one as well. We did on the last one. We sponsored a few ex-vegans on Instagram. So follow us over there on Instagram. If you want to get a sponsorship, you may be able to, uh, to hit us up when we do the, uh, the contest. I think it will be next week. Or you can sign up for the group coaching, which is starting on the 17th. It's better than private coaching. I still do private consultations. But I prefer that people go to the group coaching because you get more time. You get community support. And you get a lot more content, a lot of exclusive content, and it's just a much more fun setting to do it in. So we do two live voice chats per week. One of them is a lesson with a QA and a at the end. Another one is a straight Q&A. And we use a private forum that you can access from any mobile device at any time. Everything we do is recorded. All the conversations are recorded so that you can uh, have access to the voice chats after the fact. You have full access to this for as long as you need. And... Um, yeah, Keto and Carnivore Collective. That's starting in a couple weeks. You can sign up. Check out also... What's in the stories? What's in my stories on here? Can you see the stories? Check out also the Carnivore Cookbook for people who really love animals. The Carnivore Cookbook. Let's see if I've got a... Carnivore Cookbook. Where's the picture? I don't have any there. Here, got it right here though. The Carnivore Cookbook for people who really love animals. All animal foods... The Carnivore Cookbook. You can find that at PrimalEdgeHealth.com too. If you want to support us, uh, feel free to, of course, send super chats like Evan Schultz did. Evan Schultz, Schultz sends 10 bucks. He says, I have dopamine release when I hug my children. Therefore, I should stop hugging them because it's like shooting dope. Exactly, dude. Yeah. Barnard says, because you have a dopamine release or because your dopamine receptors, your mu receptors are hit by cheese, therefore it's a drug. Well, then any human interaction, any... Uh, learning experience any real wholesome interaction that you have in life is bad because it hits those pleasure centers right freaking nuts but um yeah all right guys check out the carnivore cookbook it's at primaledgehealth.com i'm gonna have another stream really soon the next stream it might be we might have to do a game changer stream right going with the dr gregor dr barnard um uh, theme. We've got some clips of Dr. Gregor discussing the Game Changers. We've got Barnard discussing the Game Changers. We might have to do a full stream just to review the phenomenon of this stupid pea protein isolate advertisement by James Cameron, this multi-million dollar endeavor to brainwash, into thinking, brainwash us into thinking that starving ourselves is a good idea for athletic performance and for the planet and for health or whatever other nonsense they tell us. We'll talk about that film uh, in the next one. Uh, or, I don't know, I've, I, I might have some, some podcasts to release as well. But we've got big announcements coming, guys. We've got some big changes happening on the channel here, some big changes happening with the website, really cool stuff. Um, we're excited for all the changes to come. And, uh, yeah, I'm out of here, guys. Remember, meat is a drug, <laughs> according to Neil Barnard, and cheese is just like heroin. And uh, eating meat is worse than alcohol, uh, according to vegan expert Neil Barnard. But yeah, we disagree. We know that eating meat is absolutely crucial for our health. We know that animal foods are crucial for the growth and development. And as we age, and none of us want to end up looking like Dr. Gregor and Neil Barnard, making fools out of themselves. But I want to thank Barnard. I want to thank uh, Brian Rose for kind of exposing these guys in such a nice way. I know his intention is not to make these guys look like buffoons, but they really make it, they really make it easy. <laughs> I don't think Brian Rose was trying to discredit these dudes, but he really did help to discredit them. Um, but they don't need any help. They're always discrediting themselves. Peace, guys. I'm out of here. What ups reflections? I am not a bigot. I am ready to save the planet by doing exactly what the big banks tell the TV screens to tell us to do. I feel so empowered on my hashtag vegan journey. Join us as we chant empty slogans for hashtag climate action ridden by PR firms. We need to save the earth and demand a global totalitarian technocratic government run by big finance and the fortune 100. 
Our house is on fire and we need the nice grown-up government to take everyone's land and resources and ration us delicious sustainable nutrient fortified vegan kibble. This is an emergency. Mommy Earth is crying so sad because she wants the mean grown-ups to give poor little 16-year-old human shield Greta her future back. Uh, do you have anything to add to these debates about, about just the, in particular the idea that it's kind of too expensive to deal with climate change? I mean, it is, the money is there. If we can save the banks, then we can save the world. <laughs> I mean... Jeffrey Epstein committed suicides and was working alone. Veganism is desirable and fun and make me smile big happy on my insides. I, mean, I do not this... hate children. I am not a science denier. I do like science. To fix the hashtag climate crisis we need to sterilize ourselves, starve ourselves, eat babies and grandma and move to a social engineered hashtag smart city to save the earth. There is no time to examine the inconsistencies in our claims or actions or the billions of dollars being leveraged to brainwash us into thinking we want this. We want hashtag climate action now and a hashtag plant-based food system of sustainable fortified kibble. We are not being used. We are truly empowered and full of energy that we are using constructively. We are so empowered and not deceived. We all share the same values, so we just need to align those values with our actions and join forces. We all want the same thing. We want to see an Earth in the next 50 years. The money is there. If we can save the banks, if, then we can save the world. <laughs> I mean...